November the 7th, meeting of the City Council of Half Moon Bay. May I have roll call, please? Councilmember Rarbeck? Here. Councilmember Reddick? Here. Councilmember Brownstone? Here. Vice Mayor Jimenez? Here. Mayor Penrose? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Our first item this evening is a very exciting one. It is the graduation ceremony for the Future Leaders Civics Academy members. Wonderful, wonderful young people who really care about how government works. And our city clerk, Jessica Blair, has a few words to say. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the Future Leaders Civics Academy is a program very near and dear to my heart. And I want to congratulate the graduates on their participation. They all were extremely engaged, contributed to discussions and activities in a thoughtful way, and were a pleasure to get to know over the program. This is a sharp group of young individuals with passion and drive, and I know each of them will excel in years to come. I also want to extend my sincere thanks and kudos to Colleen, Maggie, Julissa, and Irma, who put a ton of time, thought, and effort into redesigning and executing the program. This was the best academy yet, and it couldn't have happened without these four and their creativity and commitment to the students. I look forward to the next academy and wish each of this year's graduates success as they embark out into the world. Keep following your passions and you'll each go far. And remember to stay engaged with us. We'd love to see you at events and attending council meetings if there are ever topics that interest you. Um, I'll turn it over to Colleen now who will present their certificates. Thanks. I'm only going to say your first names because I only got to know you on a first name basis and I don't want to mess it up. So Jamie, come on down. <laughs> Unfortunately, some of our members couldn't make it tonight, but that's okay. Um, those two don't make it. Nicole. <laughs> Lucy. Maddie is not here. Nope. Basil. <laughs> Caleb. <laughs> Via. <laughs> Monse. Lyric. <laughs> Maria. <laughs> and Emily. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I just want to say that I had so much fun working with you all over the four sessions we had together. Like Jessica said, you guys are so bright, intelligent, you have such strong futures ahead of you, and um, watching you all in the Mock City Council meeting, presenting your project ideas, asking your questions, I am very honored to know that the future is with all of you. So another round of applause for our future leaders. <laughs> uh, 
All right, so now we're going to go cuddle around the council members and we're going to take a group photo. Thank you to that wonderful group of young people who are going to grow up to be future leaders. We're looking forward to it. And now we have the Coastside Victims Fund update, and Karen Decker will lead us on this. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor, Council, and community. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm Karen Decker, Economic and Community Vitality Manager here at the city. The days following the shooting on January 23rd play out in our minds in different ways. For the victims and the survivors impacted by that violence, we know that there are long-term needs that are going to continue over time for years to come. Setting up a victim's fund in the aftermath of a tragedy is a best practice, and it's something the city had never done, had never had to do. So I want to thank you, Council, for your leadership in taking this step to pass the executive order which gave rise to the Coastside Victims Fund. Our city attorney, Catherine, worked really closely with the city of Monterey Park and Ventura County Community Foundation to analyze and to expedite the necessary documents to get this off the ground. Erica Wood was instrumental, having set up a similar fund after the Gilroy Garlic Festival shooting and remained a close advisor throughout the whole process. Because of the work behind the scenes, this fund was activated two days after the executive order passed. It is my pleasure to introduce your next presenters. I'm so grateful to these two organizations who took a risk and leaned into managing this fund. Please join me in welcoming Amber Sturia from Mavericks Community Foundation and Wade Painter from the San Mateo Credit Union. Good evening, I'm Amber Saria with the Mavericks Community Foundation and we want to thank you for making time um, for us to give you this update regarding the Coastside Victims Fund. As you know, the Coastside Victims Fund was established to support those affected by the gun violence incident that occurred within our community in January of this year. We're honored to share the successful accomplishment of meeting the fund's goal, which was to provide direct unrestricted financial assistance to the victims. Through the collaborative, collective efforts of many contributors, the Coastside Victims Fund raised and dispersed a total of $254,142 to 46 victims. The fund itself is now closed. All victims who qualified for support in accordance with the fund protocols have received checks, we're grateful for the work of the Fund Oversight Committee, which was comprised of a variety of representatives per the City of Half Moon Bay's executive order. Their work in drafting and approving the fund disbursement protocols were, was truly invaluable. We would also like to acknowledge the collaborative support we received from the Victim Services Department of the San Mateo County District Attorney's Office their efforts in helping identify qualifying victims for the fund was also pivotal in the fund's success, um, successful distribution of support. In terms of fundraising success, the Coastside Victims Fund received support from a wide variety of sources, including philanthropic donations from California Wellness Foundation, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the Northern California chapter of the Asian McDonald's Operators Association, Mavericks Community Foundation, and San Mateo Credit Union seeded the fund with $10,000 contributions from both organizations. Notably, 
The tip jar dedicated to the Coastside Victims Fund during Coastside Gives raised over $17,000, demonstrating an incredible amount of generosity from our local community. Mavericks Community Foundation would also like to acknowledge support from Silicon Valley Community Foundation. We were able to obtain an operating grant from them that allowed us to engage with consulting services and professional PR services to help promote the fund. We are pleased to have had the fund featured on local news stations, in Authority Magazine, and in newsprint via an op-ed by former US Representative Jackie Spear. We'd also like to thank Karen Decker with the city of Half Moon Bay for her time, energy, and support for the fund. Her insight and input, particularly around PR efforts, was tremendously appreciated. Mavericks Community Foundation is truly grateful for the collaborative partnership with San Mateo Credit Union Community Fund and for the opportunity to serve these victims. Wade's going to share a little bit more information about those collaborative efforts. Hi, I'm Wayne Painter, CEO of San Mateo Credit Union and president of, Sam, of SMCU Community Fund. Anyway, thank you, Amber, and uh, good evening, council members. In times of crisis, it is the power of collaboration that truly shines. On behalf of San Mateo Credit Union and SMCU Community Fund, we are immensely proud to have joined forces with the city of Half Moon Bay and Mavericks Community Foundation in forming the Coastside Victims Fund for the purpose of raising and distributing funds to those affected by the January shootings. Together, we made a commitment to ensure that 100% of the contributions raised would go directly to the victims. There were no administrative fees or overhead of any kind deducted from the contributions. We also recognized that money alone would not suffice. Accordingly, we provided financial education to the victims and their families. We did so through a bilingual financial education workshop we held in conjunction with the distribution of the funds. Our aim was to equip the victims and their families with essential financial knowledge and skills. We believe that financial education is a key ingredient to a sustainable recovery by the victims and their families. I'd also like to acknowledge Coastside Hope for their generous donation of gift cards for gas and groceries for the financial education workshop attendees. Moreover, the Coastside Victims Fund stands as a testament to the strength of our community in terms of the collaborative effort as well as the contributions that were raised. We recognize that the lives of these victims will forever be impacted, and we are grateful for the opportunity to serve them through the Coastside Victims Fund. In closing, our collaboration in creating the Coastside Victims Fund demonstrates when we come together, we can accomplish big things in a short amount of time to help our community heal and rebuild. Thank you. Thank you both very much. That really um, made possible um, the willingness of the community to, to help out um, in a way that it worked. Um, thank you. Good job. Next we have um, United Against Hate Week proclamation. I'm going to preface this by talking a little bit. Um, United Against Hate Week is a call for local civic action to stop the hate and implicit biases that are a dangerous threat to the safety and civility of our neighborhoods, towns, and cities. When communities participate in United Against Hate Week, they are making a commitment to make everyone feel state safe and supported. Communities can counter acts of racism, intolerance, and hate by engaging diverse community faith advocacy and school groups to participate and help lead meaningful locally driven actions during United Against Hate Week. The City of Half Moon Bay stands strongly in support of our diverse community, honoring and protecting every individual 
regardless of race, creed, color, gender, religion, ethnicity, nationality, orientation, or identity. Together, we are united against hate this week and all weeks. Thank you to Coast Pride for being here to accept such an important proclamation. The important work that you do in the Half Moon Bay community is an integral part of what makes us such a special and welcoming place to live. Thank you, Mayor. Unfortunately, Coast Pride could not be here tonight, so we will be dropping this off in their honor. Great. Thank you. Okay, now it's my turn to talk about announcements of community activities, and we've got quite a few things coming up. On Thursday, we have the Veterans Eve event. It starts at 6 p.m. at McDuta Park. Uh, this is to honor our veterans and their families and caregivers. On Saturday at 10 a.m., Johnston House Holiday Open House with gifts for everyone, wine, food, good, good food, um, and great fun in the wonderful Johnston House. Saturday at 4 p.m., the Table of Plenty fundraiser wine tasting annual event, which is always a gas. Um, and that's it for my announcements. We now will have a report out from recent closed session meetings from our attorney, Catherine Enberg. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council community. Um, so the Council did meet in closed session prior to this meeting um, to discuss why not one item. This was conference with labor negotiator. Um, this is a follow-up item uh, for the city manager's annual performance re review, which was conducted at a, um, at a prior meeting. Uh, nothing to report out at this time, though I will note um, that I do anticipate bringing forward a contract amendment um, uh, for the city manager at your uh, next regular meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have our city manager, Matthew Chittister, with updates to council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have several updates tonight. Uh, but before we launch into the presentation version of this, portion of this, I wanted to just do a quick update on something that's been developing in the community and in actions that we're taking. Uh, so last Monday night, um, in response to uh, several uh, incidents uh, that have taken place in the Pilarcitos Oak Avenue community, uh, just across the highway here, uh, the sheriff hosted a community meeting to uh, talk about the work that they're doing to address those issues and to hear from the community about their concerns and things that uh, they were hoping to see from the city and from the sheriff's office to make that neighborhood a safer place to live and to, to spend time. Um, in response to that, and based on the feedback we got from the community, I wanted to announce a few of the actions that we've already taken, as well as additional work that we're doing. Uh, first and foremost, there were concerns about um, lighting in the area and how dark it is at night. Uh, you know, uh, Half Moon Bay is an interesting community. We get lots of complaints about too many street lights in some neighborhoods. Uh, but this particular neighborhood with the path that runs across the creek and into the Strawflower Village Shopping Center, I think a lot of people use it as a place to traverse and run errands night and day. And so lighting and, and safety are really crucial. And so we have identified some areas that the city has control over where we can go in and replace some of the lighting and update the lighting to make it brighter and safer, but still within the constraints of, of what we expect here in our community. Uh, we're, we're also working with PG&E to replace some of the light fixtures or light, the lighting that's on the power poles in that neighborhood that are owned and operated by PG&E, as well as identifying a few opportunities to add additional lighting. So hopefully the community will see that change over the next couple of weeks. And uh, we hope to get feedback from the neighborhood to hear how that's going and if they feel like there's been improvements there if there's more work to do. We're also looking at opportunities to provide some additional lighting on both sides of the bridge and in the park as well. The second thing we heard um, from the community was um, a desire for more security surveillance. Um, this is actually a topic that will be addressed on a broader scale at the December 5th City Council meeting. Uh, our Sheriff's Captain will be presenting information on uh, license plate reader technology and how it's evolved since our last community discussion on this about four years ago. Um, 
But in the meantime, um, based on the feedback we've gotten and the work that's happened so far, I've authorized the sheriff on a limited term to place uh, a license plate reader in the neighborhood to assist with the investigation of some of the incidents that have happened, as well as to identify locations to put uh, security cameras up. Uh, the county has a very strong policy around the use of license plate reader technology, and it's actually been utilized by about uh, 20 of, or 10 of the 20 cities already in San Mateo County. So it's a tried and tested policy. It's still something we'll watch very closely, knowing some of the concerns of our residents here in Half Moon Bay. Uh, we also, as a city, have a camera policy for the use on our facilities. We'll be applying those rules about who can access those videos, how they can be accessed, and how long they're stored uh, as part of the deployment of this pilot. Um, and, and the most important thing is it will be limited in this case to the investigation of these incidents and when uh, they're considered resolved or if we hear from the community about concerns with privacy or the way these technologies are being used, the pilot will end. And it, if we want to do something like this again, it'll be on a much broader scale and, and based on a policy that would be adopted at this level. So um, again, this is really based on what we heard from the community uh, at that meeting and a desire to help them feel safe and comfortable. Um, the sheriff, of course, is taking other actions that it normally would as far as investigating increased patrols in the neighborhood and really following up with, with individuals in the neighborhood that might have a criminal history that are involved in these incidents. And the hope is that through all these cumulative actions that the community will see an impact, feel safer, and that we can move past some of these things that have happened so far. Uh, again, we're seeking the feedback from the community. We want to be partners in this effort. Uh, we really appreciate all those people that came last week. And uh, my information is on the website, or you can approach me or call City Hall at any time. And I'm happy to talk to anybody from the neighborhood about their concerns. Captain Albin, as you know, is very accessible and wants to hear from the community as well. So we're, we're trying to balance um, the concerns of the community with the safety and security, and we know that's a fine balance, and, and we'll continue to adjust it uh, as needed to, to make sure that we resolve these issues and help the community feel safer. So I uh, just wanted to make that known publicly, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to take questions now or from the community in the future. <laughs> No question, Matthew, just an appreciation for the concerns. I live in that neighborhood, and I know it's really critical that we improve the lighting at, at a very minimum. So thank you very much for taking care of that. Thank you, Matthew. Okay. Up next, we'll have an update on the downtown streetscapes master plan from our very own Karen Decker. Hello again, <laughs> Karen Decker, Economic and Community Vitality Manager with the City Manager's Office. I'm delighted to bring this update on the Downtown Streetscape Master Plan project to you. Uh, the goal of this project is to create a more attractive and accessible and economically vibrant downtown. And we wanted to take the ideas that we heard during Discovery Week and start narrowing in on high-level design concepts. So the tool design team had a chance to return to the site and check on existing conditions and take additional measurements, but really the heart of the activity was providing additional touch points for the community to come and talk to us and talk to the design team about their vision for uh, downtown and Main Street and to pro provide some feedback um, based on what we had heard during Discovery Week. So the, the reach and the visibility of this project are significant. Coming out of Discovery Week, I was contacted by the Daily Journal to uh, do an interview, and they uh, printed a print story in addition to our own local Half Moon Bay Review. Uh, the design workshop spanned over two full days, um, including a public meeting and a second convening of the community stakeholder group. Uh, there was a special e-news announcement that went out in addition to consecutive regular weekly e-news, and that subscriber list is 4,500 people. Um, and at these latest events, we saw a lot of familiar faces from Discovery Week. 
Um, and it was really satisfying to see the feedback loop do what it was intended to do, which was to build on the community's um, conversations that had started in September. Um, the diversity of participants throughout these workshops um, is something that we want to highlight. We saw more youth the second time around during design workshops than we did the first go around. Um, after some more targeted outreach, um, we saw business owners and architects, longtime residents, property owners, newcomers to the community. Um, at one point, I saw beautification members at a table with a uh, future, uh, future leader civics academy graduate, one of our youth from the high school, um, talking about ideas, talking about parking, talking about bike lanes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, um, one more, yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of the heart of the matter, we're advancing starter ideas into conceptual designs. This is a summary of some of the key concepts that came out of the design workshop and will need to be further refined in the coming months. But really um, briefly, North Main Street, which um, I'm referring to as the historic bridge um, to Highway 1, there was overwhelming support for safer crossings. Um, the arrival experience at the intersection of 92 and Main um, left a lot to be desired in a lot of people's minds. Um, turning in and out of the Ace Hardware um, Seaport Landing Shopping Center was a big sticking point for a lot of people, as well as just in general, Lewis Foster Drive. Anybody who has had high schoolers, or even if you haven't, we know what it's like in the morning and at lunchtime and when school gets out. Uh, it doesn't feel safe um, for... Um, and that supported a lot of design interventions. For Heritage Main, so when I say Heritage Main, the historic bridge to Correas, um, there was a lot of comments and a lot of consensus around the angled parking being problematic um, for a variety of reasons, including safety. The narrow sidewalks were not popular. Um, a lot of people said it made it really hard to walk next to somebody, um, made it hard to steer a stroller, uh, there was limited seating options, which is not conducive to spending extended time in our downtown. Uh, based on community feedback, the most consensus to date on how to address these challenges um, lean towards parallel parking as a reasonable alternative to the angled parking, which I was told anecdotally that we had at one point. Um, so if this went through, this would kind of be a, a full circle return. Another idea that I wanted to flash before you was Kitty Fernandez Park. Uh, this is the largest public space downtown, if you look at the actual footprint, and it faces Main Street. It was included in the Parks Master Plan as an underutilized space with untapped potential, and there was a lot of excitement in all of our conversations around the impact that this space could have. Um, Overwhelmingly, there was a lot of support for more greening of, Matt, of uh, Kitty Fernandez, more seating, and more features for children and youth. In terms of wayfinding, um, this was looked at at different locations and for different types of signage. Um, directional, and in, in the terms of knowing that there is a historic main or a historic downtown if you turn left, or you know, two blocks from here is a public library informational signs, an idea was circulated that actually came up during the Coastside Recovery Initiative, Team Vibrant talked about this, where um, we could have QR codes on historic buildings or structures that provide more context and richness to visitors and even residents. Um, and then of course, gateways, um, marking you know, an arrival experience. In fact, some members of Beautification were talking about how there used to be an arch right at that intersection of Stone Pine and Tom and Pete's. And in um, visiting KHMB Radio, there's a picture of it in that building. Furnishing and landscaping, there was a consensus for raw organic materials and features with warm, earthy tones and colors. For landscaping, there was a desire for more native coastal plants and drought-resistant uh, grasses, but more uh, vibrant floral pops of color. So this was a, a very high-level summary of concepts that will be refined and developed in the coming months. And there will be a summary memo of the design workshop um, on our website next week. And it will also uh, cover more details that I touched on tonight and some key takeaways that we heard from the community throughout this charrette process in September and October. 
Um, I'm happy to take any questions or comments. And we also have Cindy Zerger, the principal from Tool Design, um, on the horn if anybody has any questions. I don't think so. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you for keeping us up to date on what's going on. Thank you. It's exciting. Next up, I believe we have uh, an update on the 880 Stone Pine housing development project from our assistant city manager, John Dowdy. Thank you, uh, John Dowdy, assistant city manager. Um, next, what I'd like to just give the community and the council an update is work that's um, being done to look at traffic calming on Stone Pine Road. This has been um, a consistent theme through conversations prior to any um, even identification as um, a site for an affordable housing project as concerns and issues. And I know you have heard from your constituents over the years regarding this. Um, we have made um, some revisions, but this um, proposes some new uh, modifications and um, this is also something that has been vetted through with um, civil engineer um, on the project itself with the traffic engineering firm DKS as well as working with Moz and the public works staff. So I'll just walk you through quickly um, the basic uh, premise. Um, the main um, big focus here, which has been something that has been um, identified again and raised at um, is enhancing and um, providing for a, a more protection at the crosswalk here. Our traffic calming plan includes now um, a proposed flashing beacon uh, crosswalk here, much like what you've seen in other areas. Pillar hey, hey, John, would you mind moving a little bit over in front of the mic? Your voice is coming in and out on it. Sorry. I've never had that problem before. <laughs> So, uh, and it, uh, thanks. So this would be, a fl um, at this point, a flashing beacon um, crosswalk um, at this location. This would include also um, trimming back of, of uh, vegetation to improve visibility. A lot of the concerns and issues have been raised around this corner. And um, so that's, that's a big piece. Um, followed by, at Patrick, is a second new crosswalk, and if you've been out there any time, um, you'll see that basically there is no crossing to this point and there is no sidewalk along Stone Pine here. So this would provide a um, safe uh, crosswalk um, at that point. From the perspective of what we heard from the community and from particularly those neighbors, but also from the community in general, there was a desire not to have um, any kind of uh, speed undulations, humps, bumps, whatever you want to call them. There's various configurations, um, in part because of the issues of trucks and vehicles going there. Obviously, you've got the post office with trucks going, um, as well as our own sometimes trucks heading to and from the corporation yard. So uh, what we have looked at is a several um, means to, to address that. You'll see the yellow uh, lines on this uh, faintly. Uh, what we're looking at is basically striping along and narrowing the, um, the perceived and real sort of lanes there, um, which will naturally slow people down a bit. We are also looking at two, um, two points on my, whoa, what's going on? My pointers is sort of working. Um, you'll see right in the middle of the screen is the speed feedback um, signage. So those will be pointed at each east and the west direction, providing feedback as to how fast you're driving and, in essence, say, slow down. Um, and then, um, finally, there would be also um, signage uh, striping and configure for a shared, the sharrows, the shared um, access for bicycle as well. So this is sort of a combination of, of mechanisms to try to slow down traffic and to um, provide that feedback and to provide safe harbor for those trying to cross. Um, if you go to the next one, um, thanks. 
So this is just um, a little more information in terms of what that, that easterly crosswalk point would be at Patrick. So it would be a high visibility crossing um, with signage as well and additional lighting. So part of the concerns there have been this is um, you can't see at that point. So this would include some additional expanded lighting improvements so people could see that crosswalk in better, better shape. So again, um, this is what we are um, contemplating at this point, um, moving uh, forward with, and um, just wanted to make that um, available to the community. We will be posting this onto um, the website, to the project page, so anybody who wants to look at it in more detail um, can do so. And obviously, in this, as it continues to be, we're happy to answer any questions that the community has regarding um, these improvements. Thank you. John, can you explain what a flashing beacon crosswalk is? Sure, that's uh, similar to what you find um, in several locations. Pillar Cedos, the one right out here at, at the mid-block crosswalk, um, right, right out at Kelly Avenue going to the event center. So those are press the, press the button, the flashers go off, the big signs and uh, alert you that somebody is in the crosswalk and ready to walk and, and go across. Great, thanks. Council, any questions? What's a sharrow? <laughs> Those are the, uh, the, the painted uh, messages that say, that has the bicycle on it. They've, they've created this terminology. It's share the road and it's become sharrowed, sharrow. <laughs> But it's basically the bicycle painted on there that says that you're looking to also be, as you're a driver, you're looking for bicycles on that road as well. And we painted those recently um, on, um, on Johnston Street in particular. If you want to see those, those are down Johnston Street as part of that uh, concept as well. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think that's it. We appreciate it. So I'll just do a quickie um, reminder for the community uh, that Thursday, this coming Thursday, November 9th at 6 p.m., we will be having our annual Veterans Eve event, and we hope that folks will turn out and, uh, and uh, honor um, those that have served and, um, and have a good time. And we have the scout troop uh, doing um, the, the honor guard, and we're excited about that, and there will be some treats there, as, as we always have for every event. So hope to see you and hope to see the community out. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we move on to public forum. We welcome speakers providing public comment, but please be advised, this is a limited public forum. As such, speakers must stay on topic if speaking to a particular agenda item. And if speaking during general public comment, they must address matters within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city. If speakers fail to follow these rules or use profane language, they will be warned. And if they continue to disregard our rules, their opportunity to speak will be ended. Thank you. We next move on to public forum. And I would say if anyone is here to speak about rent control, please hold off until you get to item 3B. You had a hand raised? No, OK. Uh, our first speaker is Carolina Carbajal. Muy buenas noches a todos. Good evening, everyone. El, el día de hoy quiero comentarles acerca de lo que ya Matt habló. So I, I just wanted to comment on what Matthew has already been saying. Yo vivo por 
la calle Pilarcito. So I live by Pilarcito Street. Y como parte de la comunidad. And as part of the community. Y en voz de mis vecinos también. And also from my uh, neighbors' voices. Quiero hablarles acerca de lo que ustedes ya saben. I just want to talk to you all about what you already know. Estamos pasando un momento muy crítico en nuestra, nuestro sector de la comunidad. So in that sector of the community, we are all going through this very critical moment. Y sé que en esta reunión que tuvo la Alguacil el lunes. And I know that the uh, sheriff, or the meeting that the sheriff had this Monday. Pudo estar aquí Joaquín. I know Joaquín was here. Y el here señor Harvey. And Mr. Harvey. Que pudieron observar que la comunidad está preocupada. And they were able to observe that the community is concerned. Y yo quiero comunicarles a los que no pudieron asistir. So I want to communicate to those that weren't able to make it. Que la mayoría de vecinos votó. That the majority of the neighbors voted. Porque hubieran cámaras de seguridad. So we can have some security cameras. Porque haya más iluminación. Uh, uh, brighten it up, more lights. Porque la policía haga más controles. And more uh, patrolling. Ustedes saben que nuestro sector siempre ha sido un sector uh, muy asediado por las um, pandillas. You know that our sector, our part of town, has been an area that has been more frequented by gangs. Pero en este caso, uh, la comunidad está diciendo que sí quiere que haya un cambio. But in this case, I think the community is in fact saying that they want to change. Entonces queremos solicitar y decir que sí estamos de acuerdo. So we want to ask and we also want to say that we agree que hayan esos cambios en nuestro sector. To have those changes in our part que los queremos apoyar a ustedes también en hacer ese cambio. And we also want to support you all in making those changes. Que la comunidad, nuestros vecinos están de acuerdo. Because the community, our neighbors are all in agreement. Y quiero darles las gracias porque sí he podido observar que ya hay cambios. And so I also wanted to thank you because, yes, I have seen some change. Vi que podaron los árboles. I saw that the trees were trimmed down pues ta tapaban la iluminación. because they were blocking the light. Así que seguimos esperando que haya más cambios positivos. So we continue to wait to have some more positive change. Y muchas gracias. And thank you very much. Thank you, Carolina. <laughs> Next we have... Crystalline Geet from the Kosai Chamber. Thank you very much, Crystalline from the Kosai Chamber. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to let everybody know, and I know it's early, please don't groan at me because it's before Thanksgiving, but Knights of Lights is coming. So get ready. Uh, it's going to be four nights. It's going to start the day after Thanksgiving with our uh, tree lighting at MacDutra Park. And you guys, we got four more feet on the tree. So we're just going to keep getting up there until we find out what max capacity is. Um, so come, please come out at uh, MacDutra, 6 p.m. If you have lost a loved one this year, please um, visit our website and let us know. There's a little form you can fill out so that we can um, honor them at the tree lighting during the in memoriam um, service portion that we started last year. So it's totally free and you can just let us know their details and, and we'll put them in a book and memorialize them um, at the tree lighting. And then the following Friday, December 1st, will be the more traditional Knights of Lights night of the parade and block party. We've partnered with Make It Main Street, so there'll be all kinds of crafts and goodies. And then we've partnered with Seacrest School, which will do a whole beautiful children's area. Um, so bring your kids and please plan on being on Main Street from six to eight or nine, depending how, how long you wanna party. And then, um, oh, and then we're adding this year that floats, boats, and cars that are in the parade actually get to come back around, hang out on Main Street, and it'll be a car show. Um, so that'll be really fun. And then our friends at IDES are doing uh, their holiday uh, extravaganza the same night. So we encourage people to go up and down the street. 
The following Friday on the 8th, we will have an ugly sweater party at the San Benito House Cantina. So start crafting those babies now because um, we will have prizes for the ugliest of the ugly. And then lastly, on the 15th, we will be doing um, the second annual showing of the movie Elf, Elf, very family friendly. This year we're adding an It's Italia spaghetti feed. So come on down, it's only $10 if you wanna have spaghetti. And then we'll have a prize if anybody actually eats a Buddy the Elf breakfast spaghetti. So um, please come on down and have fun and we'll have all kinds of prizes and silliness and we just wanna spend the holidays with you. So the first four Fridays, starting the Friday after Thanksgiving, there'll be something to do on Main Street. Thank you. Thank you, Crystalyn. <laughs> Next we have Rocio Avila. Um, okay, that is also. Uh, Lourdes, ¿quiere hablar sobre la, la comunidad de Pilarcito, sobre las luces y las cámaras, o quiere hablar sobre eso? Uh, yeah, so she's going to speak on uh, about the lighting on en Pilarcito. It's Lourdes. Patino, yeah. Lourdes Petinas. That's me. <laughs> okay. Uh, buenas noches, mi nombre es Lourdes Patiño. Good evening, my name is Lourdes Patiño. Y ahora pasé por ahí por, por el puente. So I was walking by the bridge today. Y miré que sí andaban trabajando cortando los árboles. And I did see that they were working cutting down the trees. Y tengo dos días viendo la, el carro de la luz también que andan chequeando and por so ahí los focos. And so I've seen a couple of days already that the PG&E or the electricity company has been there a couple of times. Y estoy muy agradecida porque sí nos, porque sí nos han escuchado. And so I'm very grateful because, yes, you have listened to us. Muchas gracias. Thank you corazón. very much. From the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Lourdes. And now we have some speakers from um, our Zoom. Yes, first we have Linda. Whenever you're ready, Linda. Thank you. Hi. I'm Linda Goldstein, and you've heard me speak. I'm from Faith in Action and COSI Jewish Community, and the article's curator for the Immigrant Advocacy Group. But what you probably don't know about me is that I'm a marriage and family therapist, and I have been so for 30 years. Um, and I'm extremely concerned about rental protections and children being affected. Can you hear me? Linda, if you are speaking about 3B, our rent control, that's not, this is not uh, discussed at public forum. You'll have to wait till that item comes up. Uh, if rental protections and rental control. Yes, the that's the same. You need to wait. Okay, then I will wait. Thank you very much. Okay, next up we have Kirsten, as long as this is pertaining public forum. Hi, yes, this is uh, pertaining to the traffic calming on Stone Pine. I'm a resident of Stone Pine and Patrick Way, and I have to say, I feel extremely gaslit by what was just presented. So first of all, as Matt knows from the emails and complaints that we have filed with him, is that, first of all, the city doesn't have their own contractors and people going in and out of Stone Pine Yard uh, under control in terms of speeding and reckless behavior and strength. Right? So talking common measures might start with the city getting contractors under control, not being up and down at all times of day, starting as, as early as 5 a.m. into Stone Pine Yard, endangering the people who are walking that has been just trying to just walk down Stone Pine Road. Second, I don't understand where the second crosswalk is going to. There is no second sidewalk. Third, the 
vehicles that are coming out of the yard. And again, my office is facing the white stone pine in the yard are huge. I have no idea where you think you're going to be putting a bike lane with the type of vehicles that these days are going in and out of the, of the city yard. Uh, next question would be, the residents of Cypress Cove have already paid with the HOA dues and other fees that they're paying for trimming of trees. Is and trimming of trees was mentioned on Stone Pine. Is this something that actually is going to be actually, you know, charged to the residents of Stone Pine or Cypress Cove, sorry again? Or is this something that the city this time will pay for because the vehicles that are going in and out of the yard are increasingly getting bigger and bigger? So I'm not willing as a resident to keep paying for all of this um, just for profit um, you know, ideas on some time. The problem with the crosswalk is that it is behind a blind curve that when customers from the post office, customers out of the Stone Pine shopping center, as well as the city contract that are coming out of Stone Pine, going towards Moon Street, not coming from Moon Street, they're going towards Moon Street. They're coming around a blind curve and they're going at high speed and we observe it every day, every day, particularly with the contractors coming in. The public is just one of them, our trash collectors. They're not absolutely ignoring speed limits and stone time at all times. So how are these guys supposed to be, what is the difference in putting slapping signs on the crosswalk than what is already there? The crosswalk is in the wrong space. Um, the blind curve is a problem. Speed limits are not observed. Neither are the signs observed, but this is not an outlet to 92. I cannot tell you how much impact we have now every weekend of cars coming down, turning around, noisily in at the same time end because people think that this is an outlet uh, for some other reason because Apple Maps is showing them the video maps and the is that there's a street. Nobody's observing these sounds. So I totally get that. Thank you, Kristen. Mayor, we have no more public comments online. Okay, that's it for public forum. We move on to consent calendar. Does any council member wish to pull something from the consent calendar? Seeing none, may I have a motion, please? Yes, I move that we adopt the consent calendar, items 1A, waive reading of resolutions and ordinances, item 1B, um, an ordinance amending Title 13, Water and Sewage, sewage by adding Chapter 13.22, Fats, Oil, Grease, and Sand to the Half Moon Bay Municipal Code, second reading. Mm -hmm. Item 1C, final acceptance of the Main Street Safety Improvements Project. And Item 1D, final acceptance of the Corporation Yard Improvements Project. To get a second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. I don't believe we have any ordinances or public hearings this evening, so we move on to item three, resolutions and staff reports. And we'll start with 3A, professional services agreement with job train. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Karen Decker will do this presentation for us and um, turn the time over to her. And it looks like she's being joined by Erica Wood. Good evening, Karen Decker, Economic and Community Vitality Manager with the City. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you this evening, and I'm joined by our Economic Development Consultant, Erica Wood. 
Uh, we're here this evening to provide an update on the Opportunity Center of the Coast Side and to recommend executing a professional services agreement uh, for employment services and to go forward with a request for qualifications to retain a qualified entity to operate a new business incubator. Here you see a photo of the new home of the Opportunity Center. Is it not advancing? Oh. There we go. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, here you see a photo of the new home of the Opportunity Center at 637 Main Street. The Opportunity Center's purpose is to provide support to job seekers and to small businesses and to entrepreneurs. This is a one-stop shop with co-located services that will be operated by our local Chamber of Commerce. It's an ideal downtown location, which is part of the reason why we're so excited about this in particular. It's within walking distance to complementary services. It's accessible by public transit. And our hope is that these services will really help uh, reactivate that 600 block of Maine. You know, I had the pleasure of going to the ribbon cutting for Blue Dragon Pho on Friday, also located on that block. And so um, great things are happening. Um, Uh, here you see a graphic that is meant to be illustrative. Um, this is in regards to um, the space planning and how we're sort of envisioning these services. So on the left, you have Suite A, which is where the business incubator will be located. Um, in the middle there in Suite B, we have a really large classroom and a community kitchen. And then in Suite C, we have the chamber and two nonprofits that will, providing, will be providing the job seeker and small business development support services. We really want this to be a state-of-the-art space that is welcoming. Um, you want someone to feel like, I, I like it here, I can get resources, I can get help with my business or help finding a job. Uh, we're designing a space that is intended to be flexible and to feel modern. It has co-working spaces. It has hybrid-enabled meeting rooms. Uh, we are working really closely with our architect to incorporate these principles into the design. Thanks, Karen. Good evening, council and community. Happy to be here. This is an at-a-glance view of our progress to date with the Opportunity Center. I'll start with saying I think it's important to note that the city received its first payment from the 2.5 million in June. And in just four months, we have a facility, we have a signed lease agreement, tenant improvement are beginning, and we have executed contracts with wonderful service providers like the Chamber and Renaissance Entrepreneurship Center. As a reminder, Renaissance Entrepreneurship Center will provide the critical support to our small businesses. They really specialize in immigrant-owned uh, small businesses, and they'll provide training and support, um, which we are incredibly, incredibly excited about. Um, Karen mentioned job train. We're also excited to have identified them as uh, best in class nonprofit. They made the 2023 great nonprofits list. That's a high bar. Um, and they've been really involved in providing support and services at similar economic advancement centers in South San Francisco and North Fair Oaks and have uh, the ability to collaborate and partner, partner with Renaissance. Um, you know, we were really impressed with uh, the conversations that we've had with them and their very thoughtful approach to taking time to understand what makes the Coast Side unique, some of our specific challenges, and how best to tailor programs to meet our needs. Um, they really have a proven track record of helping unemployed and underemployed turn their lives around and the ability to help them climb the economic ladder. Um, the proposed workforce development program that they are offering um, includes assistance with rapid employment services, as well as career training, upskilling in high demand industries like construction, healthcare, and technology, to name a few. Um, and you'll see here the last point is what they've proposed in terms of outcome and likely impact that they will at least touch 110 people with some type of service. 
Of those 110 people, uh, 66 will go on to opt for specific job placement support, and 60% of those will end up with jobs or 40 individuals making a living wage. So we're, we're confident um, that they will be able to be a real value add to us. Um, the other aspect and effort that will be housed within the Opportunity Center is the Coastside Incubator. You know, why an incubator? An incubator is really intended to help spur needed innovation, build our entrepreneurship capacity, and help it create local jobs, most importantly. Um, they are the entities that provide that really critical early stage support to startups and entrepreneurs as they take viable ideas to market. They're not new. It's not a new strategy. There are many incubators and accelerators across the United States. But we believe we have an opportunity to do something really unique. And one of the things that we think will set our co-site incubator apart is our extraordinary coastal environment and our natural resources that will offer startups an opportunity to really focus in on climate resiliency and ideas and jobs in that sector. Um, imagine what happens when climate disasters strike, power goes down, electricity goes out, communication systems are a mess. We've certainly experienced that here on the coast. What if we could replace a fossil fuel generator with a solar powered nanogrid? That would be a more mobile, a more sustainable and easy to use climate solution. What if we could help replicate and scale regenerative kelp farming to create jobs and restore the health of our ocean? So these are some of the things that are possible with the business incubator and possibilities that bring benefits as it relates to the economy, the environment, and social benefits too. I will say, stepping back and thinking about all 15 recommendations that Karen and I have, have been working on with this council's leadership and support, the incubator has seemed to be the most complex and daunting, and I feel like it is in our line of sights in a way that has never been true before, and that's because of some real um, recent momentum we have heard from potential advisors potential startups that want to join with us, and there are a lot of funding opportunities to, to go after. So with that, I'll let Karen um, repeat our recommendations. Uh, so we're here this evening to ask council to authorize staff to move forward with a professional services agreement with JobTrain in the amount of $337,000 in addition to releasing a request for qualifications to bring on that qualified entity to help launch the business incubator. Council, do you have comments or questions? I have a couple things. Oh. Okay, that I wanted to say. One was I want to make sure that, um, when we're talking about job training, we are talking about training people to work on the coast, especially in Half Moon Bay, but on the coast in general. And that our focus is not to train people and then send them over the hill for jobs. Um, and it sounds like that's what you're aiming at. The second um, thing that I wanted to remark on was, uh, is gone from my head right now. Oh, yes. And that was, it, this is a county and city and chamber of commerce cooperative. We're all working together for the same thing. So I am hoping that we are working f with the entire coast side. Um, I like the idea of kelp farming. Those, you know, those ideas. We need to be including the harbor district. We need to be talking to people in Pescadero and San Gregorio. So this is all very exciting. Here, here. <laughs> Robert. Uh, just a quick comment and question, maybe the rest of council can help me remember. Um, I think it was last session, um, we had a report out 
on that fiber optic mm. project for Mid Coast, and the guy's name is Richard. No, who? Greg. Greg, Greg sorry. Viegas. Right. And I remember he was saying, you know, they were sussing it out, and it was kind of expensive. I'm thinking maybe for the incubator, if we could get some expertise, because a lot of it is the expense of laying the fiber optics. And I know some other small towns have actually done it themselves. But anyway, I thought that might be an interesting connection. Maybe get Greg to explore that with the incubator yep. and bring in some other experts and figure out maybe we can do this ourselves if he can get some help with an incubator. So just something to put on our radar screen. Because, yeah. boy, could we use some fiber optics as an alternative. Yes, so, yes. Um, yeah, just want to connect the dot. Thanks. Great thinking. Can I have a motion then? Just confirming, Mayor, was there any public comment Ooh, on this item? Idea. Thank you, Catherine. You remind me of that every time I'm up here at the dais. <laughs> I forget it every time. Thank you. Do we have any public comment? We have no online speakers, Mayor. And I see no one in the audience. So now may I entertain a motion? Sure. Um, I move that we adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a professional service agreement with job train in, a, in an amount not to exceed $337,000 for a term beginning November 1st, 2023 and ending September 30th, 2024. And two, develop and release an RFQ to identify and retain a qualified entity to launch and oper operate an incubator to be located at the Opportunity Center of the Coast Side for an amount not to exceed $200,000. Second. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Rarbeck? Yes. Councilmember Reddick? Yes. Councilmember Brownstone? Yes. Vice Mayor Jimenez? Yes. Mayor Penrose? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. This is very exciting. Okay, we're going to take a five-minute break, and I'm going to limit it to five minutes. We need to be back here at 8.15, and we will hear item 3B. plan work session. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members, and Community. Um, John Dowdy, Assistant City Manager, and with me is Mike Noche, your, your housing special uh, specialist there. And uh, we're here to um, present as succinctly and um, simply as we possibly can, um, a very complex item, um, which is a package that um, is a policy conversation regarding tenant protections, um, which includes the potential of rent control, um, ex um, tenant protections themselves, potentially, um, rent space control of mobile homes and also addressing potentially um, code enforcement related um, relocation assistance. So it's a complex issue. We'll try to be as succinct as we can and allow um, you and the community to um, get into the dialogue. Uh, what we are um, recommending um, for process is that we will do a brief um, presentation with Mike doing that. And um, what we would suggest is we follow the normal routine of clarifying questions by the council, community input, community comment. And then what we would suggest is allowing us to sort of work with you through kind of each of the questions and to try to find um, a consensus point on basically the four primary um, decision points we're dealing with, which have 
sub pieces to each one of those. Um, what we will also say is that um, clearly in the in uh, throughout this process, we understand that there are a lot of potential things that can be included within any number of these ordinances. We recommend that you and frankly the community and their comments um, hopefully maybe focus primarily on the bigger policy question and issues um, and those will then drive um, what happens beyond that point where we can then engage in a more detailed conversation about what all those potential iterations of any given piece of legislation that you ask for, any ordinance that, uh, that you may wish to proceed with. But that's just guidance and, um, and the council's prerogative um, to choose how you wish to go, but that is what we would suggest is probably the easiest. And this is kind of um, similar to the process that, that we got um, through the electrification process in particular was sort of that deliberative process. So with that, I will hand it over to uh, Mike and um, we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you, John. And good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Again, Mike Noche, Housing Coordinator. Uh, appreciate the introduction. And we'll go ahead and get started. Um, before we get into those four um, distinct uh, areas uh, for your council consideration this evening. I'm uh, going to provide some background about our rental housing stock. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so total amount of housing units that we have within the city of Half Moon Bay, we have 5,098 units. 28% of those units are renter occupied. And of the the which 28% uh, is equivalent to uh, 1427, as you see there. Uh, that rental unit uh, breakdown, uh, roughly 400 are affordable deed restricted. Uh, so they are uh, protected, typically have uh, lengthy deed restrictions between 30 to 55 years, uh, limited rents already in, uh, exist for those units. Uh, we also have roughly, uh, our estimate is around 627 single family homes and condos. Uh, and those, that's an important number to, to call out and I'll get into that in more detail. Uh, that leaves us with around 400 multifamily units and we'll interchangeably use the term multifamily, uh, means any unit with two or more, uh, units, uh, on that property, uh, is a, often referred to as a duplex, triplex, and so forth. Uh, so you'll hear multifamily units uh, referenced throughout the conversation. I also wanted to um, make it clear that uh, the city's jurisdiction is only within its boundaries. Anything beyond the city's jurisdiction would be handled at the county uh, level on uh, unincorporated regional uh, coast side level. So uh, anything that the council decides on would be within uh, the city boundaries as shown here on the map. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention, you know, locations like El Granada, Moon Ridge, Montera, Moss Beach, uh, any areas to the south of town would be outside of our jurisdiction. I also want to acknowledge that uh, part of uh, the city's commitment to affordable housing um, and providing uh, housing security is, is uh, goes into great detail in our housing element update, uh, which we are working very closely with the state to certify very soon. Uh, that number in the housing element, uh, our goal for our eight-year cycle uh, that's currently in process is 480 units. We plan for, for more than that as, as required by state law to have a buffer. Um, and we have many sites that are listed in the housing element, but I wanted to share with the public and those listening this evening that more information on the housing element specifically uh, is available on the city's website, uh, hmbcity.com forward slash housing element. Um, I'll also make a note that uh, the development of these uh, new units, uh, they are weighted toward lower income units. So that is a requirement as well. So uh, we'll now segue into some conversation about rent control. Um, and I've got a couple options. And um, this portion of the presentation um, not, isn't meant to be 
uh, go into to great detail on the exact provisions of some of these uh, current existing laws, uh, but really meant to point out some key aspects of these uh, current laws that are in place. So the first of those laws is the Tenant Protection Act. Uh, it's a state law uh, which was enacted, as, as you can see, in 2019. Um, the key aspects of, of this law is there are, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, there are rent increase limits that are incorporated into this law, um, pretty much between five and 10% lately with uh, the consumer price index being so high. We've seen uh, increases essentially can be no uh, greater than, than 9% or excuse me, 10% uh, being the maximum. Uh, only certain types of units, as you'll see here on the screen, um, are included in uh, that state law. So single family homes, condos, if a duplex has an owner living in one of the units, they are exempt. Uh, there is also a 15 year, uh, any building that has been built within the last 15 years would be exempt. So uh, going into 2024, anything built after 2009 would be exempt from the Tenant Protection Act. Um, so pretty much what is included are multifamily buildings, so two or more units uh, built uh, prior to 2009. And then I'll also mention we do have information about the Tenant Protection Act on our website because it is an existing law. Um, and this is one of the options if, if and I'll get into this in more detail, um, but if council were to en enact a city level um, ordinance on rent control and veer toward the Tenant Protection Act, um, that would essentially make the city the enforcement mechanism. Whereas right now it's a state level and, and would be handled privately through uh, legal um, organizations for a tenant. So uh, moving on to the Costa Hawkins rent control. So this was uh, enacted in 1995, and similarly to the Tenant Protection Act of 2019, um, it has some similarities in regards to the units that are included, as you'll see here. Um, single family homes and condos, regardless of age, are exempt. Um, so this does not have the, the duplex with the primary owner um, provision included. Um, and then pretty much any multifamily uh, building built prior to 1995 would be able to be uh, included if a local jurisdiction enacted a rent control ordinance that was aligned with Costa Hawkins. So we cannot violate Costa Hawkins. Um, it is a state law. So any rent control that is enacted at a local level has to fall within these constraints, essentially. Uh, the Another important thing to note about Costa Hawkins is whereas the Tenant Protection Act um, maxes the rent increases at about 10%, uh, many jurisdictions that uh, go the route of the Costa Hawkins rent control, um, including buildings you know, built prior to 1995 only, um, usually have a more restrictive rent increase percentage, so typically between 3 and 5%. So considerations between uh, those two options are, are before council for discussion this evening. Um, as I highlighted briefly, there's two essentially models that uh, council could consider, which would be uh, currently what's existing under state law, which is a privately um, in enforced, so it's not necessarily enforced by the city, it, it's up to a, a tenant to bring legal action against their landlord if they felt like they were um, being uh, mistreated or had an unlawful uh, rent increase or eviction uh, under current law. Uh, if the city were to enact a, a rent control, we could choose to become the enforcement uh, authority, essentially, and then we would uh, take it upon ourselves to review cases and so forth and issue citations. Uh, we can get into more details there. Um, both options regulate annual increases and they still allow for existing protections to remain in place. Um, neither option requires uh, rent reduction, so I wanted to make that clear that, that rent control 
would not uh, create a situation where landlords are required to reduce their rents. Uh, they can continue to rent their, their units at the same level that they're offering them at. Um, they would just limit the increases that happen annually. It's also important to note, I uh, mentioned there's roughly 400 multifamily units in the city. Uh, our estimate is that some of those units may not qualify if, depending on the options uh, based on owner, uh, an owner living in say a duplex or, or other provisions um, that maybe would disqualify a unit from being included in, in a specific option. Uh, so 350 units is our, our rough estimate of, of what potential rent control measures would include. And those are all multifamily units. Uh, the options where the city uh, is taking on the uh, author authority um, to pursue um, violations, there would be expected administrative costs. And um, we go into detail in the staff report on, on potential estimates. Um, I think we were ballparking around 250000 or 300000 for the first year for implementation and an operating budget of, of roughly 150000 needed if the city were to take on that uh, responsibility. Uh, and then I'll, I'll segue here into rental protections um, in a second, but I also want to mention that uh, potential uh, city involvement could include licensing or, or registration for all rentals, and this would be pretty much a key data uh, collection uh, standpoint on uh, knowing how many rentals and, and what they're being offered at. And I, I believe, if I'm not misspeaking, you could include single family homes in that uh, registration. Potentially, we'd have to look into that further, but that could be an option that's in front of council as well. Um, so the two first bullet points here that are listed under tenant protections, these are existing tenant protections that I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear that these are existing, they have uh, passed and are, are there for, for tenants um, and landlords benefit. Uh, the Tenant Protection Act of 2019, as I mentioned, so I won't reiterate that, but I also wanted to uh, highlight that Half Moon Bay passed the residential, residential uh, rental security measures. Um, that information is on our website at hmbcity.com forward slash housing. The city's rental security measures include a 12-month lease uh, requirement as well as uh, potential landlord and tenant mediation. Uh, additional tenant protections that, that council could consider um, adding would be uh, increased relocation payments uh, for a no-fault eviction. Uh, so that's a situation where the tenant um, did not create a situation where they were uh, liable for the, the fault or at fault for the eviction. Um, some jurisdictions set a dollar amount, uh, others set a additional uh, tack on additional months of uh, rent payment that would be paid to the, the tenant um, in certain situations. Uh, a subtenant uh, tenancy regulations that, that is something that's uh, a little more specific to some of the needs we've uh, heard from the community in regards to uh, home sharing and uh, overcrowding situations. So we could go into more detail there if, if council wishes or, or pursue that further. Um, and then potential anti-discrimination uh, ordinances as well. Um, I won't spend too much time on the next two, but I want to just highlight them briefly. The mobile home space rent control um, this would be applicable to Kenyatta Cove and Hilltop Mobile Home Parks. Um, the county does have a uh, mobile home space rent control uh, ordinance in place that was attached to the staff report this evening. Uh, that, again, is only uh, applicable to unincorporated areas, um, so it does not include the two uh, mobile home parks that were within Half Moon Bay and that would limit the space rent. Um, and space rent is roughly between uh, $600 to $1,200 per month um, at different locations from what, what we gathered. Uh, the code enforcement related relocation assistance, this uh, would come into play when a unit uh, is not properly maintained and the city has to take action um, in a situation where 
Uh, it is not safe to occupy a unit. Um, it would make the potentially make a landlord um, liable for relocation assistance um, should a, a tenant have to move out of a unit. So that is uh, for council's consideration as well um, and would provide some financial support to renters. So with that, I will um, turn it back to, to council unless there's anything John would like to add um, for clarifying questions. Thank you. Council, do we have any clarifying questions? Yes. Can you define what a subtenancy is? And, and could we ban them? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I can start. Um, so our understanding of, of why the subtenancy um, is so popular, I'll say, or, or used so much is that um, we don't have enough housing stock to have. Let me, let me answer the first sure. question was, Pretty direct. What is what is subtenancy? And um, we we've used subtenancy and room share, house share, kind of interchangeably. Um, what we're defining it generally for the purposes of this conversation is is if you choose to pay money to rent a portion of a home, meaning a bedroom or whatever in that place, and you've basically created it, and there is either a property owner who is doing so, or there is a primary tenant who has leased and or rented the entire home and is basically allowing and taking rent from other folks who are taking bits and pieces of that property. Some of those, and one of the concerns we've identified is that we hear, and you know, again, some of it's anecdotal, but, but we have to believe that some of it um, is true, is that um, folks aren't being offered all access to the home, for example, to kitchens. Um, is one area that we're concerned about, which means that people are having to potentially have hot pots and hot plates and all of those things in the rooms, which were not designed for ventilation, for for electrical you know, surcharging on those types of things. And so those are some of the bigger pieces and questions too with that. And um, and then also, you know, we have again anecdotally heard of folks who are um, who are charging probably more than what they're actually paying as a as the as the master tenant for a home for um, rent so some are making income off of those situations so they're arbitraging the situations basically um, can we control subtenancies is is that possible uh, i would Probably defer to to Catherine. Um, let's see what she says, and then we'll go from there. If you want. <laughs> All right. So I haven't researched this question. Um, I will say it raises some property rights questions in my mind about completely banning the ability to sublease. Um, that said, we are aware of of at least one jurisdiction, City of San Francisco, um, that does regulate um, subleases. Um, prohibiting uh, tenants from subleasing um, for more than they are, you know, leasing themselves. I, I would only add that from a staff perspective, nothing that we have put on paper or, or to this was an idea of trying to remove the subtenancies because what we have heard over and over is that subtenancy room sharing, home sharing, whatever we want to want to categorize it is a significant piece of the affordable housing rental equation. Um, so I think our perspective as staff has been let's figure out a way to make it work for everyone a little better um, if, if that's the if that's what you choose as council to do so. But um, that was it's, not our intention and I know that's not what you were suggesting. It just seems like that's an area of, of abuse and you've already identified mm -hmm. that and people out in the audience have identified it as a as a place of abuse. It seems like if we could take a closer look at that. Um, and then does the county have rent control? No. Okay. Any other council members with clarifying questions? Yes, Councilmember Brownstone. Um, regarding the one hundred fifty to two hundred thousand thousand dollar administrative cost of starting up, and I was looking um, in the staff report. So, 
some areas raise some of that money by fees, administrative fees, right? So if we had 350 potential units, that would be covered, right? Um, I think is what the number you what, put up well, a, a moment ago. We were, what, it is, it is commonplace that, um, that these become a user fee under, under state law, and under the user fee you can charge what it takes to administer and manage and deal with a, a, a program that, it, that the government undertakes, and that would where this, is where this would fall. So um, the That's answer is, is that it's pretty commonplace that, the, um, that, that property owners are responsible for paying for their fair share, right. in essence, of, of what those the costs are right. to administer. And what would be a um, typical fee range, would you say, that from what? I don't know if you researched that piece, but. Before, before you answer, we're just hearing from the audience. It's a little hard to hear. So if everybody can speak oh, much more directly sure. into the mics, please. In terms of a reasonable fee charged to the owner of a um, unit, rental rental unit, what would that average, would you say? Just, the, um, the challenge, uh, I'll say, is, is what's um, <laughs> one reasonable is in the eye of the beholder and the, um, and the person being asked to pay. Yep. Um, what, we were all, what we're suggesting is, is that if there is a program and a cost, that cost be borne by those who are um, uh, participating with it. Uh, that being said, it really varies. Um, for example, I'll, t I'll, I'll put Alameda out there. Their, their fee is um, around $180 per unit. Per unit. Uh, per okay. unit. Um, and it actually is split equally between the, um, the tenant and the landlord under um, uh, property mm -hmm. owner under, under their provisions. Annually? But, have, but uh, annually. Annually, and they have, but they have um, fourteen thousand units. So their their yeah, program yeah, so. is a two and a half million dollar right. program. So, so we maybe can't get the economy of scale that that kind of program. And maybe, a, or maybe it'd be a percentage of yeah. rent per unit or total building per unit, something like that, right? Okay, that's good enough yeah. for to answer my question. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, I wanted to. Uh, find out a little bit more about the number of available units that we can talk about for either TPA or Costa Hawkins. Um, and you came up with a figure of 350. Yes. Is that correct? These are units, correct? They're not 350 individual. They're 350 units. That could be a eight room unit or it could be a single room correct correct so these okay. are these are 350 units which can be which are configured either in a duplex triplex fourplex or a multiplex five or more units so right. those are the total unit counts right so if you put uh, a family of four into a single unit then you're talking about four times 350 or 1,400 people, souls. If you put two families of four into a single unit, which is the story that we've heard, happens a lot, then you're talking about 2,800 people. So we're talking about a significant percentage of the population of Half Moon Bay, which is 12,000. Okay, that was, that was my question, thank you. Okay, with no more clarifying questions, I think we can move on to public forum. Our first speaker is Rocio Avila. Rocio is going to provide all of her comment, and then I'll go ahead and do what's, what's a site translation of what's written down. 
Buenas noches, miembros del concilio. Mi nombre es Rocío Ávila. Trabajo como campesina, promotora comunitaria. Mi esposo trabaja en la jardinería, agricultura y en lo que encuentra. Jafome necesita de nuestros servicio, servicios esenciales en la comunidad, pero el pago es muy bajo en estos trabajos. Es por eso mismo la situación nos ha arrinconado de una manera que, no, que nos da las condiciones para poder vivir en Huffington Bay de manera saludable. Para que ustedes puedan vivir bien, nosotros nos sacrificamos mucho. El que nosotros podamos vivir de manera digna depend depende de ustedes. Estamos contando con su decisión política para que haya un control de la renta y se abran más lugares para que nuestras hijas e hijos puedan crecer en un ambiente digno. Good evening, all members of the council. My name is Rocio Avila, and I work as a farm worker and a community promote, promoter. Uh, my husband works in um, the gardens, uh, landscaping, agriculture, and whatever it is that he can find. Half Moon Bay needs um, our service, or essential services within the community, but the pay is very low and for these jobs. And that's why the situation uh, has kind of backed us up into a corner in a way that we don't have the conditions to be able to live in Half Moon Bay in a healthy way. So in order for people to live well, uh, we have sacrificed much um, and in the way that we can live in a dignified manner uh, depends on you all. We are um, counting on your decision, your political uh, decision, um, that to have this rent control and open up more places so that our daughters and our sons can live in a dignified environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rocio. Next, we have Lourdes Patinas. Buenas noches, ya me conocen. Soy Lourdes Patiño. Good evening. You already know me. My name is Lourdes Patiño. Y estoy aquí para ver si nos pueden ayudar en, en que haya un control en las rentas. And I'm here to see if you guys can uh, help us with rent control. Porque está muy cara la renta y nos, y pagam, y nos pagan el trabajo muy barato. Because rents are very high and we get paid very little. Y por eso a veces vivemos con otras personas para poder pagar la renta porque está muy cara. And that's why we at times live with other people so that we can pay the rent because it's very high. Y estoy aquí para ver si nos pueden ayudar a que haya un control de la renta. So I'm here to see if you can help us out to have some kind of rent control. Y muchas gracias por escucharnos. And thank you very much. Se los agradezco mucho. Gracias. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for listening. Esperamos su ayuda y que haya aquí un control. And so we, we wait for your assistance and to have some kind of control. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Lourdes. Next we have Vance Ferdarami. Good evening, council members. Uh, my name is Vance Verderami, operating manager for Kenyatta Cove Mobile Home Park. My dad, Jack Verderami, built this community. First phase completed back in 1972. Kenyatta Cove has been family owned and operated for over 50 years. Family owned and operated business for over 50 years. I was 12 years old when I attended the city council's approval meeting and then went on to work in, on construction, digging the utility trenches, shooting grade for the street construction with my dad on the tractor. I sold my first mobile home to the first customer I ever had when I was still in high school. I have sold homes here full time since 1983 when the final phase was completed. Kenyatta Cove maintains all infrastructure, including streets, gas lines, sewer lines, 
all electrical transmission. In addition, Kenyatta Cove maintains the clubhouse, pool, fitness center, all landscape common areas, and walking trails. This is included in the homeowner space rent. Homes sell in a timely fashion and have appreciated in value year after year. This proves a rent stabilization program already exists here. Our 20-year lease limits annual space rent adjustments between 3 and 6% based on the published CPI index ending August 31 for the greater Bay Area. While thinking the city's involvement may seem like the right thing to do, there will be un unintended consequences that will upset a very fine balance we've achieved here. The city will be burdened with unnecessary admin and legal costs year after year if a rent control ordinance is adopted, straining the budget further, taking away from other much needed city projects. Let the free market work. If we are unable to keep up with inflation, Kenyatta Cove maintenance and amenities will suffer and lower our residents' home values. If buyer and seller understand and acknowledge the 20-year lease agreement and the homes continue to go up in value, why would we need an extra layer of government intervention? Does the city want to get in the mobile home park business? I'm hopeful you will be thorough during the investigative research process, and I welcome a meeting with each of you to discuss further. Thank you. Thank you, Vance. Next up, we have Carolina Carvajal. Buenas noches otra vez. Good evening once again. Como ustedes saben, esto ha sido una lucha constante. As you all know, this has been a constant struggle. Y el, el pueblo está demandando una solución. And so the people are asking for a solution. Para hablar técnicamente de lo que ya nos explicó Mike. So speaking technically about things that Mike has already explained to us. Dice que contamos con 5,098 uh, casas. He indicates that there's 5,098 total units. Y dice de que 1,427 son designadas para renta. And so 1,427 are designated for rentals. Y nosotros somos una población de 12,000 personas. So in Half Moon Bay, we're, there's 12,000 people. Según el censo del 2020. Uh, according to the 2020 census. Creo que hay una gran necesidad de vivienda. I think there's a huge need for housing. Porque escuché que la señora Debbie preguntó que por qué vivimos hacinado o cómo se puede controlar eso. Because I heard Miss Debbie mentioning about how could that be possible. El problema es que vivimos hacinados y muchas personas se aprovechan de eso. So the problem is, is we live like this and a lot of people take advantage of it. Porque no hay más casas para rentar. Because there's, there's just isn't any more homes to rent. No cumplimos con los requisitos para rentar una we, casa digna. We, we don't have the prerequisites to rent a dignified housing. Aparte, no contamos con el dinero suficiente para poderla pagar. And aside from that, we don't have enough money to be able to pay for it. Ahora decir que pensar que vamos a comprar una casa es más descabellado. And so to even consider or think about that we're going to purchase a home is even more kind of out of, out of the park. Havon Bay fue... fue fue establecida como una ciudad de campesinos, de agrícolas. So, Half Moon Bay was founded as a farm worker community. Hace muchos años atrás. But we're talking many years ago. Ahora es una ciudad de ricos. And now it's a rich folk town. Que no cualquiera puede vivir aquí. And not just anybody can live here. Alguien que tenga una casa tiene mucho, mucho dinero. So, somebody who has a house has, you know, has a lot of money. Gente pobre como nosotros no podemos. So poor folks like us. Aunque we, trabajemos muchos. We just can't do it, even though we work a lot. Y me entristece también escuchar que hay personas que les preocupa 
el dinero, de cómo va a salir, de dónde va a salir, cuando so, todos pagamos. It saddens me that some people are just concerned about the money, like where are we going to get the money, where is it going to come out from, where, you know, we're all involved in this. Personas inmigrantes también pagan taxis. Immigrant people also pay taxes. Personas que están aquí legalmente también pagan impuestos. So undocumented people also pay taxes. Y ellos no se están pensando cuando yo esté viejo no voy a recibir nada de eso que pagué. Ellos no piensan que cuando ellos estén adultos ya mayores no van a recibir nada de eso. So they, they're not thinking that when they're kind of older they're not going to get any of that. No se están quejando de que eso les va a quedar a ustedes aquí. They're not thinking that all of that is going to remain here for you all. Cuando nos deberíamos de preocupar cómo vive nuestra juventud. When instead we ought to be worried about how our youth are que growing esta, up and living. Esa juventud nacida de estos latinos aquí. So that youth born out of the Latinos here. Será el futuro de su país. Will be the future of your country. Porque estos viejos inmigrantes. Because these old immigrants. Regresarán a morir a su país. Are going back to their country to die. Porque no podemos vivir ya viejos aquí. Because we can no longer Porque ya no tenemos fuerzas para trabajar. Because we don't have any more strength Porque no tenemos our, algo que nos va a sustentar cuando estemos viejos. Because we don't have anything to sustain us when we're older. Así que para mientras, creo que un control de la renta. So in the meantime, I think rent control. En estas poquitas casas que tenemos. In these few homes we have. Es importante. It's important. Porque no podemos darnos el lujo because we don't have the luxury de tener a nuestros hijos en un cuarto cada uno. To, to have, you know, a kid in their own room. Vivimos una familia de cuatro en un cuarto. So we live a family of four in one room. Esa es nuestra realidad. That's our reality. Pero estamos trabajando por ustedes. But we're working for you all. Por su país. For your country. Y queremos que esto mejore también. And we want this to get better. No queremos cosas gratis. We, we're, we're not asking for free stuff. Algo justo que pudiéramos pagar. Something just where we can afford. Y mientras eso llega? And in the meantime, un control de una renta digna sería bueno. A good thing would be rent control. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolina. <laughs> Next we have Fernando Peña. Good evening, Mayor Penrose and members of the City Council. That's a tough act to follow. I'm very appreciative of Mrs. Carbajal's very impassioned plea. I came here tonight to talk about rent control, obviously, and I'm here on behalf of the San Mateo County Association of Realtors and in opposition to the Tenant Protections Plan. Not so much because of that impassioned plea but implementing and managing rent, rent control will strain the city's resources. The cost to the taxpayers are significant, starting at $300,000, and as you mentioned, annually 150 to 200,000. But that's not the most important thing, right? The most important thing is to take care of our immigrant community and our low-skilled and low-paid uh, service workers. But we have to think creatively. We can't just keep blaming housing providers and landlords and realtors. That's not the way to govern. Rent control has many unforeseen negative consequences on small mom and pop housing providers who are your neighbors, who are your constituents, including withdrawal of units possibly from the marketplace. Even though you're talking about only 350 units, there could be increased lawsuits and of course the impact of maintenance of the units themselves. And as we've talked about, AB 1482 and the Half Moon Bay Municipal Code, Chapter 7.70, already provide protections to our renters and housing providers here in Half Moon Bay. Adding another level of regulations on housing providers will be costly for them to administer. And there are already numerous resources available, available for both tenants and housing providers here in San Mateo County. I applaud the council for working so closely with San Mateo County. You've been very creative in coming up with housing for farm workers. Let's continue that. Come up with creative solutions. 
it's a fact that we live in the fourth most expensive county in, in the nation. And we have nine, nine billionaires that live in San Mateo County. Why don't we approach some of those to come up with some type of rental assistance program or some creative solutions rather than continuing to blame housing providers? I urge the council to focus on its efforts on producing more housing instead of these misguided regulations that discourage uh, much needed housing and only creates red, more red tape, bureaucracy, confusion, and costs. None of these provisions add one, uh, one unit of housing. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Next we have Elaine Gilbreck. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Elaine Gilbreck. I'm the Executive Officer of San Mateo County Association of Realtors. And I'm here to speak about one portion of the landlords, the housing providers, who we call the mom and pops, who have a big heart and really think about the tenants and want to help them and are following all the Tenant Protection Act ordinances that are already in place. Our concern is that some of them may want to just give up if there's more onerous protections on them and they may want to sell the properties who could potentially be purchased by business people who don't have the heart for the tenants. So in the efforts to try to help the tenants, you might want to consider that some of it may actually work towards hurting them by getting the good landlords out of the housing provider business. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Next, we have Linda Croce Anderson. Croce. Or Croce. Can you actually, pronounce it, please? I, I'm happy to. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. Linda Croce Anderson. From I'm a local realtor, and I'm also a director on the San Mateo County Association of Realtors and the California Association of Realtors. And what I li would like to discuss today is my opposition to the Tenant Protection Action Plan. Many of our local landlords, as you've just recently heard, are mom and pops, and they run across all cultures. And these people are just, they're trying to create generational wealth for their children and their grandchildren. And they're doing their best with what they have. And if we impose these laws, how are they gonna maintain their properties? And we're gonna run into a complete blight on our beautiful coast. So please, think about this, and think about everybody concerned, so that we can find some kind of solution that works for all. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Next we have Tony Serrano. Uh, good evening, um, um, uh, Mayor, City Council members. Um, I would like to speak in favor of rent control and um, rental um, protections. Uh, I want to emphasize uh, the mental health of our community. Um, renters who are struggling to afford their housing are more likely to experience anxiety, depression, and stress. This is because they are constantly worried about whether they will be able to make their payment and avoid eviction. This stress can take a toll on their mental and physical health. Rent control can help to reduce this stress by, by stabilizing rental prices and making it more affordable for people to stay in their homes. This can give renters a sense of security and stability, which can improve their mental health. In addition, rent control can help to prevent displa displacement which is, which is another major factor that contributes to poor mental health. When people are forced to move because they can no longer afford their rent, they often lose their social connections and support systems. This can lead to feelings of isolation and loneliness, which, which can exacerbate mental health problems. For all of these reasons, rent control is a necessary policy to protect the mental health of our community members 
It is a policy that can make a real difference in the lives of people who are struggling to afford their housing. I urge you to support rent control so that we can create a community where everyone has access to safe, affordable, and stable housing. Opponents will use scare tactics and often will argue that rent control stifles investments in rental properties, leading to deterioration and a decline in housing quality. However, empirical evidence suggests otherwise. St studies have shown that rent control does not discourage new construction or overall investment in the rental housing market. In fact, rent control can incentivize landlords to maintain their properties as they know they will have a stable stream of income from long-term tenants. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tony. Next we have Enrique Bazan. Good evening, members of the council. I'm bringing 27 letters from community members who don't feel confident speaking in front of everyone, but would like to share their stories of why it's important to stabilize rent at, in Half Moon Bay. To give you an example, a woman says that she was expelled from her home along with her four minor children when her husband was seriously ill with terminal cancer. That family ended up on the streets and sleeping in a car. There are heartless people who do not care for the suffering of others. Please read the letters so that you know how urgent it is to move forward with the Tenant Protection Action Plan. And as a reflection on a personal note, I'm the father of two daughters. And um, sometimes they need attention if somebody's not doing well in school or if somebody's sick something happens that is in disadvantage for her own development. And paying attention to the person who is sick, it doesn't mean that I don't love the other one. It means that somebody needs an urgent attention for the, its own develop, her own development. That's all, all I'm asking, thank you. Thank you, Enrique. <laughs> Next we have Ray Abalea. Mayor and Half Moon Bay City Council. My name is Ray Abalea. Over the past year, ALAS here in Half Moon Bay has coordinated a countywide community assessment to learn more about factors that influence substance abuse and mental health in the Latino community here on, in the county and how to better prevent substance abuse. When we work together with community organizations across the county, including the Boys and Girls Club of the Coast Side, on this assessment that was funded by a grant from the San Mateo County Behavioral Health and Recovery Services, we got some shocking but not surprising results. Over 500 surveys and 120 interviews consistently showed that the urgent need to address mental health and substance abuse is to address the cost of living in our area. Adults who worried about affording the basics were more likely to use substances and uh, the, and we're also more likely to experience three or more days of loneliness, sadness, or depression in the past month. A crucial way to address increased anxiety and mental health issues is to address affordable housing and the cost of living. 51% of the people surveyed said they worry from time to time about having to pay for the very basics like food, rent, and utilities. 28% often worry about these things. Our number one recommendation from this assessment is to address financial challenges to support families to survive and thrive in this economy. And let me just say something personally as someone who grew up here on the coast. You remember in the 90s those hair club commercials where that guy would say, I'm not just the CEO of the hair club, I'm also a client? Let me just say, I'm not someone who helps to organize this kind of research and data and numbers. I'm also a renter. And I never thought I would see a day growing up here that it would be so unbelievably unaffordable to find a place to live. Any renter on the coast side can tell you that. Um, 
I want to underscore the point that Tony Serrano Garcia made, that when you think about rent control, think about mental health. Think about advocating for public health. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. And now we have some members on Zoom. Yes, Joanne, you're up. Thank you so much, City Council, for allowing the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Joanne Rakoski. I'm a member of Coastside Faith in Action and the Unitarian Universalist Coastside community. I thank you, first of all, for your commitment to creating and maintaining affordable housing in Half Moon Bay, especially for those of low, very low, and extremely low income. As noted in the document for the study session, preventing displacement of those currently housed is vitally important while developing additional housing. The new housing does not magically appear. It takes time. So I applaud your efforts in this regard and particularly acknowledge the commitment in the uh, presented document to creating protections for subtenants who rent one or more rooms without having a signed lease in place. And I also appreciate your intent to make sure that provisions of current law are actually implemented in Half Moon Bay, whether by education or by city ordinance to authorize local government enforcement of its existing state laws. I ask you at this point to make sure that in the work ahead, that the city addresses the gaps in both current AB 1482 and SB 567, uh, which will be implemented in March of 2024. Now that the San Mateo Board of Supervisors has paused their efforts toward tenant protection, it falls upon the local jurisdictions to better protect current renters, and their needs have been amply documented. Although lots of gaps remain despite these two bills, I call particular attention to the fact that the protections in 1482 and in 567 do not apply during the first year of tenancy. You can see the challenge uh, and the potential for um, abuse that could result uh, from eviction at day 364. The tenants need protection from day one. And again, I thank you for the opportunity to make a public comment. Thank you, Joanne. Next, we have Rovi Lin. Hello, good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Rovi Lin Antonio with the California Apartment Association. We represent rental housing providers and operators in San Mateo County. I wanted to provide some information to help supplement your discussion this evening um, based on the information that was presented by staff. One thing um, regarding the question on enforcement, whether it's private or local enforcement, I wanted to first clarify that SB 567, which was signed by Governor Newsom last year, enhanced the statewide um, Tenant Protection Act to actually include a local enforcement mechanism that authorizes your local city attorney to um, enforce aspects of the AB 1482 rent control and just cause eviction, meaning that under SB 567, they can cities locally can now have the city attorney not nullify termination of notices or rent increases if the owner is not in compliance with the state's Tenant Protection Act. I believe that information is very useful in your conversation tonight about enforcement. I also wanted to recognize staff's acknowledgement that there is statewide rent control um, in the Half Moon Bay benefits from that. No longer you are seeing rents increase by 20% or above or double digit even given that the statewide 1482 is does cap rents. On the comment regarding the just cause evictions, I wanted to remind this council that you um, 
has your own local minimum lease term agreement um, to close the gap for people that don't have just cause eviction from day one to year one of tenancy. So that has already been um, been addressed. A couple um, issues too regarding anti-discrimination. Um, that is already a law. It's illegal to um, discriminate anybody based on immigration status, income, or um, gender, or um, or marital status. And also regarding the subtenancy, I just wanted to know, let you know that the under regular um, standard operation, subtenancy is typically not allowed. Meaning if a tenant wants to sublease their um, a rent a, a unit that they are renting, they have to ask permission from the property owner if that is allowed. If it's not, then that's actually cause for termination. So um, regulating the subtenancy, I'm not sure how that works because on that situation, you have the renter actually becoming the landlord um, as, as a master tenant. So the question is, who is going to enforce any of these policies? Are you enforcing it against the owner or or the master tenant who violated the lease to begin with by having subleasing? Um, finally, uh, really support additional farm worker housing, more rental assistance, and please find a way to really look at your landlord mediation program that you implemented in 2020, look at the results and finding ways of how can this be more utilized, encourage residents when there is a tenant and landlord dispute. I think a lot of the conflicts that we're, we may be hearing is based on not understanding the full extent of the law um, and a landlord and tenant mediation would definitely help in that effort. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Alice. Hi, thank you so much again for addressing this to city council members and staff and all the research that's gone into it. I just want to underline what everyone has been, well, what a number of the speakers have been saying is that it's very important that the city is the enforcement and the oversight of all of this to, for people to go privately. People that I speak to are a, unable to take off work to go to legal aid, B, afraid, and C, are also people who are not ones to make complaints. Um, so in the meantime, I do hear a lot of what's going on is just constant re um, raising of the rents. Even we just had a friend here recently that they, they raised the rent um, three times it, over the course of six months, he didn't even have a rental agreement from this person. So I think it's really wise of the city to gather that data to know what's going on within our jurisdiction. I mean, I think we know what happened and how shocked we were about the housing conditions of the farm workers on the mushroom farm and how badly we felt that we didn't know what was going on. I think it's really important that the city knows what's going on in the city and also is there to help protect the, the tenants in this. So any and all of these of, of the above that you had mentioned are really great steps towards it. Ultimately, if we could start with a lower rent to begin with, and I know that's not part of this, but that's the reason why there's some tendency is because people can't afford what the market rate is at this point. And there are people that are hardworking that we need so I encourage you to do everything you can on behalf of the people who are holding our city together. So thank you. Thank you, Alice. Next we have Saolo. Thank you, Council. Appreciate your time. My name is Saulo Londoño and I'm with WMA. We work with owners and managers of mobile home communities in California. I'm here today to recommend against including mobile home rent control as part of the tenant protection plan. Mobile home residents in Half Moon Bay currently have what we in the unique mobile home industry call a careful balance. So what does this mean? It means mobile homes sell in a timely fashion and they grow their value year after year. It also means rents in Half Moon Bay mobile home parks are lower than rents in nearby communities. Communities that are located in the unincorporated part of the county and as such are subject to rent control. Your own staff report reflects this. So how is it possible that the mobile home rents in Half Moon Bay are lower than
than those in rent control areas of the county. Due to the uniqueness of this housing model, operating these mobile home communities is basically like managing a little city. So to us, it's no surprise that the mobile home rents in Half Moon Bay are lower. I mentioned a careful balance because the balance can be very easily disturbed by outside factors such as rent control. We know that mobile home rent control ordinances lead to, they lead to less housing stock, more deferred maintenance in these communities, they lead to higher costs for everybody involved, and they always lead to a more adversarial relationship between the residents, the city, and community managers, which is not what you guys should want. These are your local business owners and affordable housing providers. They're not faceless international corporations. These are family businesses that have operated in your city for over 50 years. In the case of Cañada Cove, Vance and his dad have been operating in that community since before Vance was a teenager. We urge you not to include mobile home rent control as part of the tenant protection plan. Maintain that careful balance that exists in Half Moon Bay mobile home parks. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We have no more public speakers online right now. Thank you, Maggie. Um, that brings us back to Council, and um, who would like to start? I would. Council Member Rarbach. Um, what are we doing here? Why, why do we care? Um, it seems to me that we really have an obligation to our lower income renters in Half Moon Bay. Anybody who's been to any city council meeting in the last year has heard these horrible stories of large families sharing a room uh, without access to kitchens, um, it, uh, substandard conditions, rent being raised arbitrarily. Um, I believe that the the issue of uh, lower income families uh, having the ability not to worry about rents going up and up is really important. But there's a whole uh, cascade of uh, issues that are all, all interrelated. And that is that the... That's not um, the way I want to handle it. Well, I mean, um, you can do it that way if you want. Uh, well. okay. Sorry. Um, the the issue is that many many uh, of the people that we want to protect, and as we've heard, there's probably over a thousand in in Half Moon Bay, uh, are involved with. A room sharing, rent, uh, house sharing, subtenancy, and if we are going to protect those people, then the first thing we need to do is find out who they are, and the only way to really do that is to have licensing and registration of the landlords who are renting to these people, and after that. We need to encourage absolutely the uh, uh, rental agreements being written down, not just the uh, verbal agreements that uh, often occur, so that we, we know who is charging what for the, the rental uh, of these uh, often m m shared houses, uh, duplexes, triplexes. So I urge us in our ordinance to require licensing and registration. I also encourage us to educate the, the renters to know that their rights are going to be protected a lot more if there are written rental agreements. So that's the first thing that we need to do. Uh, I also think that we should use the Costa-Hawkins model uh, because that would allow the 
the city to cap the uh, rent increases at less than the current uh, uh, 1482. I would, as my own personal uh, opinion, like to cap the the rents at 5% a year or the CPI, whichever is lower. I think that's a reasonable way to protect the um, the rental uh, of our uh, uh, lower income people. And the last thing, and this is sort of peripheral, I've received over 75 emails, almost all from realtors. Um, uh, Sam Carr is apparently encouraging people to write. Almost all the 75 are from outside the coast side. And one of the people mentioned as a, uh, what he or she thought was a, uh, a deterrent, that if Half Moon Bay passes this rent control, then God knows what's going to happen to the rest of the communities in the county, that they would then be inspired by the fact that we wanted to protect our lower income renters, and they might then uh, in, uh, implement rent control. I think that's a wonderful thing. I think we should be leaders here. I think we should protect our lower income people. Uh, but we need to do it in an intelligent way that we can actually uh, st stop the, the home sharing and the subtenancy so that we have a handle on that. And I'm willing to have the city pay $200,000 uh, or so to implement this because I believe it's really important to protect our uh, workers who are the backbone of the uh, city. So that's my position. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Robert, Council uh, Vice Mayor Jimenez. Thank you. Let's do a little bit of history. Um, gentrification, you know, our community was really affected by gentrification back in uh, 2017. 2018 came around the, the corner, and during that year, the beginning of the year, more than 50 families were evicted in less than a year. 50 families. That's a lot. There was no reason for eviction. There was no cause for eviction. I heard from the realtors, actually it was you who went to the pops and moms, you know, businesses, uh, apartments, houses, asking them to raise the rent. Because they were cost, actually they could get more money out of them. I remember that. I was personally here, if you go back on the Half of May Review, March uh, 2018, with more than 300 signatures, you know, from the community requesting rent control because of the evictions that were happening. And it's still happening. Those evictions of uh, 2017, 2018, what caused? It was uh, for families to move in with other families. That's what happened from there. Many families were not able to move anywhere else. Some families moved out of the area, out of the state moving to Oregon, Washington, Nevada. Some left the country because they could not afford to be here anymore. The rents were going up. <laughs> it was ridiculous just to find out how much you know the rents were going up. And it's happening right now because there's no control, there's no contract. And you were talking about discrimination, it's illegal to discriminate. When a low-income community goes out to apply for an apartment to rent, there's ways that you can discriminate against them. You know how to do it. You're within all your legal right to do that, but that is discrimination because there is no, uh, the, the, they're undocumented, because they uh, don't make enough income a year you have too many kids, all that, all those reasons. You know, I'm sorry, somebody else got the apartment. 
So we have to do, I strongly support rain control on half one bay, I strongly support. Because you already heard data from uh, Tony, from Ray, about you know, how it's affecting our community, or children. So I'm, uh, of course, I'm gonna support rain control. Like I said, check and go back to the newspaper, 2018, where we requested rain control and see what it was happening. Now, or Latino community or low-income community, not just Latinos, but other low-income communities, they're struggling. And that's affecting our children. Far that was going on in our schools. The use of alcohol and drugs at a young age. That all that comes from how they live. It's not only with the adults. It's not only the adults that are actually dealing with you know, the use of drugs and alcohol to, uh, to cope. The children, check their grades. Go to the school district and request the school grades, how they're affected by that. They don't have a place to do homework. There's no privacy. They live in dangerous conditions because they have microwaves and small refrigerators in each other's rooms for them to keep the food, for them to cook the food because they're not able to afford the high rents that continue to go up. 5% rent raise, I mean, every, every year, we're talking about 5%, that's nothing. We have renters in half of Bay that are actually increasing the rents 20, 30, 50%, three or four times a year. We have families paying 1,500 for an apartment. The landlord was, oh, now you're gonna be 3,000. So how can, you, how can you not think about rain control? So don't, I know about pops and moms in our apartments, how they were against that, you know, raising the rents because you were pushing them to uh, say, oh, you can make more money. That's gentrification. Moving our low-income community out of, the, out, of the, out of the coast. You heard from other people. It is a low-income community, the base of our economy, and yes, they do not get a retirement. When they move out, that retirement stays here. You know how much they get on retirement? You work out as a farm worker to the age of 65, $700 a month. That's the retirement they get. Some get even less. A few weeks ago, two weeks ago, our oldest farm worker passed. He worked to the age of 84 because he cannot make rent with his retirement. He got he was ill, and about a couple of weeks ago, he passed. Imagine you working to the age of 84 in the farm. So now, do you want rent control? I do. This is statistics that show why we need rent control. There's data. So I know, of course, rain control. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. <laughs> Council Member Brownstone. Well, first, um, thank you for everyone who has spoken here, called in, given us your opinions. Um, thank you, Council Member Rarbach Jimenez, for your perspectives. Um, you know, I remember when I first ran for office on City Council, um, part of the process was having a number of organizations saying, if you would like our endorsement, fill out this survey. 
um, and then come and speak to us. And one of them um, was Sam Carr. And it said in the survey, before I even spoke to anyone, it said, if you run for council and win, do you promise never to support any rent control ordinances and say anything or in, uh, campaign on uh, for rent control? And I remember that. And I was kind of a, and, and I went to the meeting um, and I was very clear at the beginning of the meeting that I wasn't looking for the endorsement because I was offended by those requirements before I even ran for office. I grew up in a rent control department in New York City, in the Bronx. Beautiful six-story building, ivy-covered, a uh, nice park across the street. And every year there were, you know, probably 5%. Uh, rent raises and um, and very close-knit community had a happy childhood in the neighborhood loved living in the building um, they painted every four or five years if you asked for in the apartment um, it seemed to work well and so I've always been a strong supporter of rent control and um, read all the emails that I got from um, realtors and you know it was kind of a cut and paste email and I'm just trying to figure out why the community of folks you know mostly realtors I, I mean do you I'm not sure how you see this city. I mean, we're a city that takes care of our homeless. We have a beautiful transitional facility. We have um, cares so that first responders to uh, mental health situations aren't always um, sheriffs. They're people who can handle and de-escalate crises. We have Abundant Grace um, that helps provide livable wages and honorable work for homeless folks. We have a project at 555 Kelly in collaboration with Mercy Housing, which is a nonprofit housing organization that builds very high quality housing. I don't understand why would you th why you would think this is a community which wouldn't support rent control because we're a community we're only as strong as our weakest links in our community people who don't have access to expensive attorneys people who can barely afford sometimes have to make choices between paying the rent and feeding their families and we've heard these stories here for not just this last year, I've been hearing them for four years. And students coming in um, uh, from the high school before COVID, when we had live sessions before COVID, telling us they didn't, couldn't even have a space to study uh, in their own homes. So, um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, if you have mom and pop landlords with families and children, and you've said, you know, there's good, there's good landlords here. And I feel probably most of them are. And this isn't really going to get in the way of those landlords. But it will protect folks who um, overcharge. I mean, I heard someone talk about, hey, free markets. You know, it's anything but free. <laughs> this rental market and um, there's always people who look for less than reasonable profits and some people look for obscene profits so I think rent control um, I think we could put good process in place I really liked what Roe v. Lynn Antonio talked about that um, yeah our own city attorney can nullify unreasonable rent increases and evictions. 
Um, so I think we should pursue a rent control policy here. I need to think a little more about the mobile home in um, um, in the cove. I wasn't sure. I don't know how many of those um, homes are rented in terms of, yeah. So I'm not sure we, I don't know how much um, oversight we need on that. I don't know, I don't know enough. So, um, and someone just said zero <laughs> to really rent it out. So, you know, we could look into that. I don't want to over-regulate where it's not necessary, but um, I just really appreciate this council and its willingness to always look out um, for those who need a helping hand, not a handout. These aren't folks looking for handouts, you know, just a helping hand from um, being overcharged when it's not necessary. So um, that's where I stand. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Brownstone. Councilmember Reddick. Sure. I certainly would support uh, revisiting the city's uh, residential rental security measures. I think there's a lot of abuses still happening. I'm guessing that the the primary landlord's probably getting a cut from the uh, the subtenancy, um, which is very unsavory. I, okay, I, I think there's a lot of abuses going on, and I think we need to take a look at um, stopping those. So as the county looked at their tenant protection measures, um, I think it would be good to look a little deeper. I certainly, if we can, um, register and license uh, landlords. I think that's a, a great idea. I'm in favor of data collection. Um, I totally hear everything everybody is saying about the problems we have with housing. They're immense. And Half Moon Bay is not going to solve them, right? Um, and including, you know, rent control. It's not going to roll back rents. Yes, it might lower the, the, the rates that they can be increased, but it's not going to really solve the problem. We need more housing. We need more assistance from the federal government. The federal government is supposed to be the primary uh, agency for funding housing. It's standards that are nationwide, and it's not happening. So I hear you. I suffer with you. I want to build as much new housing as we can. But um, I don't have enough information to support uh, rent control at this time. Um, I especially am having a hard time wrapping my mind around the cost for setting up a, a rental control bureaucracy within the city, including enforcement, possible litigation. Um, I think it's probably more than $300,000 a year. But you know, the next item on the agenda is the quarterly financial report. We know that we have a structural deficit for the next many years, four or five years. That means that we're already spending more than we're taking in. Uh, the hotel business is down, sales tax is down, the city is losing money. I don't think you can say we're broke, but we're spending more than we're taking in. You know, we, we have to pay the county a lot more money than we were paying the iBank for the, the lease at Stone Pine. We still have the library to pay off. Um, right now, based on what I know about the finances, I can't support anything that's going to add new staff. You know, we'd have to use our existing housing staff. So, you know, if you want my support for, it sounds like you don't need it for rent control, I need to understand a lot more about the cost. Because uh, I also have, when I became a city council member, I assumed a fiduciary responsibility. I am, in effect, a trustee. I have to keep the city afloat. I have to manage our money appropriately. My heart goes out to you, but I have to pay attention to the books as well. And that's just the bottom line. It sounds cold, but if we don't have money, we can't help you. And there's no new money on the horizon. So at this time, I can support uh, increased protections. You're looking at increased protections, trying to stop abuses, helping the situation as it exists today. But I can't, at this time, without a lot more information, support a rent control ordinance. Um, we don't have the economies of scale to pay us back to make it work, as far as I can tell, on the limited information I have. So at this time, I, I can't support my fellow council members on, on moving forward. I understand the problem. I'd like us to solve it. 
I can't support rent control at this time. And I'm, I'm sorry, I know it's not what you wanted to hear, but I feel I have a, additional responsibilities as your city council member, and that means managing taxpayer money appropriately and keeping the city afloat. And you're going to learn this next item that we've got real financial problems. So I don't know how you, you know, expect to pay for this. It has to be paid for. So that's where I'm coming down. Thank you, Council Member Reddick. Um, I have to say that I appreciate your point of view, um, but I have to say that I disagree with it. It's um, my job as council member is to represent the people of my community. And the people of my community are comprised of 30% Latinos, most of whom are not living well, most of whom are living poorly, most of whom are struggling. And they're my constituents. They're the most needy of my constituents. So if I have to prioritize, I'm going to be looking at the folks that need help the most first. Not that I don't care about the others or about our fiduciary, fiduciary situation. But I, 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 my heart bleeds. I, I can't stand listening to, to the lives that these people are living. I am absolutely for rent control. I am not necessarily for rent control for the rest of the, of the century. I think it would be reasonable to look to limiting it to a certain number of years. One of the things that we're trying to do is build affordable housing. And I see this as a stopgap measure until we get more affordable housing built. I don't know that that's going to happen quickly. We've got 98, 97 units uh, on the horizon that we may be able to say we've got um, in the next year or so, but that doesn't cover the amount that we need, certainly. But it's a beginning. And in the meantime, I think protecting our most vulnerable is critical. So. I am a ha in favor of the Costa Hawkins approach. I would like to see us um, put a limit of 5% or the CPI, which either is, whichever is lower on rent, rent increases. I would like to see us absolutely license and, and, and um, license and register all of our renters. I think until we do that, we're not going to know what all the abuse is that's going on. Um, I am not particularly, in, I don't feel well informed about mobile home parks. I haven't heard from mobile home residents. I haven't heard them coming and saying our rents are too high. So until, until we have more information from the constituents, from the folks that live there, I don't want to deal with mobile home rents and rent control. Um, but I am coming down in favor of an approach that Council Member Rarbach has taken and Council Member um, Brownstone and Vice Mayor Jimenez have. I am definitely in favor of it and I am definitely in favor of the Costa Hawkins approach. Uh, I, I agree with the mayor that it would be uh, reasonable to limit or sunset uh, rent control uh, to three or five years. In that time, we will know more whether we can actually have a, a built enough affordable housing. Um, I believe that the uh, tenant protection ordinance that we've already passed uh, hasn't really resulted in any actual uh, help to any tenants, as far as I know. The, there's been no uh, mediation. There's been no uh, action that 
has helped any tenants. Not that it wasn't a well-meaning uh, idea, it just doesn't actually result in any uh, useful protections. Um, I also agree that the mobile home space rental control is, is not something that uh, uh, at this point makes a lot of sense, so I wouldn't uh, support that. Uh, we haven't talked about item four, the code enforcement related relocation assistance. Um, I'm strongly in favor of that. Had we had that uh, relocation assistance in place when the shootings occurred in January, the people who had been displaced by the um, shootings would have had a, a decent chance to uh, relocate with a, a reasonable um, amount of uh, uh, assistance. And I think that we owe it to this uh, our citizens who get uh, evicted uh, because they're living in substandard conditions, th that we do uh, give them, I don't know, two or three months rent minimum. Um, so that's where I'm coming up on in these uh, additional questions that have been asked of the council. Thank you. Council Member Brownstone. Um, yeah, I want to address uh, some of what uh, Council Member Ruddock talked about because I too am on our finance committee. I'm resigning. You're resigning? Oh, okay. Well, I'm on the finance committee. So I am also looking pretty carefully at our, carefully at our budgets. Um, and, and I also was concerned about, you know, the administrative costs and how much it will actually end up costing. And we have to look at that a little more deeply. We can charge fees, which I imagine even conservatively could pay for at least 75,000, you know, half of that cost. Um, and we can see about other, you know, look, looking within our current budget, um, because you know, Council Member Reddick, you've often talked about mental health issues being one of your key areas of attention this year. And I know it came up when we talked about funding for um, ALICE to provide mental health services, and we didn't agree on that. But we hear incessantly about the mental health issues created by expensive housing. So to me, this is a mental health issue. I can't prove how many people will have better mental health if they're not constantly worried about having their rents raised, you know, 10 or 20 percent in a year. And, you know, maybe we'll look at our community funding grants also. Take some money towards that to get this thing off the ground, you know, whatever, whatever it takes, I think. Um, mental health of our community, you really can't, you really can't estimate the cost of people driven to the edge by financial stress. You can't really measure those costs. And we can't go in there and say, hey, look what happened here, or this incident, we could have, you know, you can't put a cost on that. So I think, um, rent control in this community is also a mental health issue. And so it's another way of impacting community mental health. And we've had a number of speakers address that specifically and the research that's out there. So um, we'll figure it out. We'll protect our budget. And um, that's what we do. We are ex fiduciaries for the budget. And we're also here as protectors of the health and safety of our community. So we'll figure out that balance. I trust that we will. I'd like to say one more thing about, um, about our priorities. We have spent a lot of time and a lot of energy in the last five years trying to get 
a community perspective on what they want to see from the council. Uh, we've opened up, opened up. We, we have listening sessions. We listen to folks talk. We have made translation possible. We, we have um, folks that speak only Spanish. We have translators for them so that we can hear their voices. And we've got five priorities that we allowed ourselves this year. The first priority is affordable housing. This is what we're talking about. Right now, we're talking about affordable housing. And we're not talking about having affordable housing. We're talking about keeping the unaffordable housing less damaging, less awful, putting some, some sort of a rain on it. It's, it's not enough. It's never going to be enough. Rent control is not the answer. The answer is building more housing, period. But in the meantime, people are suffering. And this is our priority, and it's my, my priority. Let's get it done. Mayor, if, 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 if I could, uh, just for clarity, uh, could we, if, if I don't want to stop the conversation if there's still a conversation, but I, um, it would be helpful for us to just walk briefly through for five minutes, sort of just getting clarification on what we think we heard from you, and maybe that's the easier answer for us is to, is to basically um, tell you what we, what we think you said, and then you can correct or you can define it out from that point, but I think three to five minutes maximum would be, sorry, <laughs> again, uh, would be helpful just to be clear and also for the record and for the folks in the audience too. But, um, but I, don't, I don't want to belabor the point. By all means. Thank you. I, I will say what we've um, heard tonight. Go back. Go back. Go back. I want to just make sure we're, is that um, we've heard consensus that yes on rent control and a consensus, not, not, not everybody, but a consensus that yes to private, um, to um, city enforced and Costa Hawkins. And we've also heard yes to licensing or registration and, and initiating that sort of right up front to get a better handle on, um, on the numbers and who. Fair enough? Is that what? Okay. Thank you. Next. Uh, we've heard... Um, I think around and about yes to proceeding with tenant protections, obviously including anti-discrimination and other related protections, subtenancy issues to the extent that we can, um, enhancing what we're doing already under existing regulations um, and ordinances that are in place, but how do we build on those um, from that point? Fair? Uh, yeah, we, with an emphasis on trying to educate renters that it's in their advantage to have a written agreement because that's not the case now. Fair enough. Thank you. Click. Um, we've heard um, a consensus, I believe, to um, table uh, mobile home space rental control for the time being. Um, like you, we have not heard um, a peep from folks, and that's unusual in this community. If they have, if, if this community wants to speak, they will speak. Um, I think their um, silence has spoken, so thank you. And um, is that fair enough for, for tabling that? Um, and what I've generally um, heard is a consensus to move forward with um, the code enforcement related uh, relocation. Thank you. Um, if I could, just two minutes next is just uh, obviously mobile home out of there. Um, from staff's perspective, uh, we've heard um, a desire to look at all of these. And um, frankly, they ten tenant protections and rent control go together. And the code enforcement related relocation expenses is really a separate issue. Um, so absent the mobile home, um, I don't know that there's really a prioritization that occurs here other than we're, we would be um, ramping up on probably 
um, both of those those tracks. And um, as, as painful as that is to say to some extent, because the work that that's going to be, I just don't think there's a um, probably a way around that. And I think that's going to be your desire to do as well as the communities. Am I sensing that from the council? I think so. Okay. That would um, conclude that perspective from that. Thank you for clarification um, for us and for, I think, for the, the record and community. Thank you. Anything else from any council member? Are we all finished city staff? Anything that you need to say? I apologize if I missed. I think John did a great job summarizing, um, and I think my notes reflect what John just um, shared back to you. So I think uh, the direction is clear. Um, we will return likely December 5th with more specifics to our plan, although it's, it's clear. So I don't think there's a lot of discussion that probably needs to happen December 5th. So we may forego that and just go straight into working on uh, the ordinances so that you can start reviewing the details of that and the nuances of that. Great. Thank so, you very much. And, and I'll just say, you know, staff heard loud and clear the urgency and the priority to this. And so it, it will be a focus of, of staff over the next uh, couple months so we can get this move forward. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move on to item 3C. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have Ken Stiles, our finance manager coming up to the dais to present on this item. And I will also play a role in the discussion tonight. All right, good evening, uh, Honorable Mayor, Council, members of the public. Today we are presenting the financial and treasurer's report. Uh, this is a presentation that's quarterly done, and this is for the first quarter ended in September. So this presentation is pretty high level, um, but in the uh, the agenda packet, there's much more detail and analysis. I'll be walking through the revenues, expenditures, and our outlook. Starting with revenues, we have our major revenues with a comparison to the prior year based on budget. Um, because we are a quarter through, um, it's intuitive to think that uh, revenue should be about, should be 25% of budget. But uh, remember that revenues timing is uh, can be different based on the revenue. For example, property tax, uh, we get it. We get two large payments in December and in April. So because um, we don't receive revenues timely, um, evenly, we compare that with the prior year. Starting with TOT, we budgeted 9.6. We've received about 9.61. This is about 10% of the budget. Um, it's close to what it was doing last year during the same time period, but it's still stagnating. And we are still keeping our eye on that. As council remembers, um, TOT has taken a dip since February, beginning of this year. And we're still kind of, re we're still recovering from that. And I have more information on the next slide. Property taxes, we had a budget of 3.9, we had 12,000. Um, again, we get this, our first big payment in December. So this is, this is trending exactly as expected. Sales and use taxes, we budgeted 3.2. We received almost 300K. We're doing uh, ever so slightly better than last year um, in comparison. So this is tracking as anticipated. It's still a little bit early, but it's, it's nice to see that it's, um, it's going along as we planned. Other revenues, uh, we've received about half a mil. Uh, we've budgeted 4.4. Again, this is category is also tracking as anticipated. Um, so overall, we've received about 9% of what we budgeted for. In comparison to with last year, it's about the same percentage-wise. 
Um, so on paper, um, looking at this, it looks like we're turning it along, but TOT is still remaining a line item that we're closely watching. This chart shows our TOT for the past 12 months compared with uh, the year prior. The darker teal is for 2023 and the gray columns are from the year prior. As you can see, um, we got our first dip in November. Uh, it spiked up in January. We thought, well, maybe we had an, a, a moment and we recover. But since February, it's been down. Uh, there is a bit of a silver lining in that July and August, the first two months of this fiscal year, the gap has, is a little bit closer than what we saw in, in February. But we're still keeping our eye on it. One of the big questions that kind of arises when we look at this chart is, uh, well, what happens if we don't hit uh, our TOT number this year? Uh, we didn't hit it last year. Uh, we're still holding, uh, we're still looking to see if we're going to hit it this year. And if we don't, uh, luckily the city does have unassigned funds that act as a cushion. Uh, I have an upcoming slide on that, but our unassigned funds right now are estimated to be 1.4 million uh, at the end of this fiscal year. So if we were to have a shortfall, um, still too, way too early to tell, um, we, we do have a little bit of a cushion there. On the expenditure side, we are looking good. Because expenditures are a bit more regular and more timely, we look to see if we're at underneath that 25% uh, budget. That's our benchmark for our operating departments. So with all of our departments being underneath that and overall being under by 11%, it's looking decent. We do have some salary savings that we're expecting uh, that we'll come to realize uh, at the end of the year. A couple of departments have vacancies. Um, we've chosen to uh, hold them open until we know more information about how this year is going to turn out. Historically, we tend to finish fiscal years uh, coming under budget. Uh, last year that happened, we came under budget by about a million, half of that being salary savings. If that trend continues and we have some savings at the end of next year, at the end of this year, um, that would be helpful as we go into the budget process uh, for 24-25. Here's how our, how our fund balances and reserves look like, uh, estimated to be at the end of June 30th, 2024. Uh, this table has two columns. Uh, the first column is showing what numbers um, we adopted a budget at back in April. So when we adopted this year's budget in April, uh, we did not know what our beginning uh, assign, unassigned balances were going to be. We had thought that we were in, we had adopted a budget planning for having unassigned be at 185,000. Then we, we adopted the budget. Um, we had a couple more months of activity, financial activity. We had our audit in September, and then we were finally able to close the books for last year. With the uh, final number for our beginning balance, um, we had some savings um, because we, are, we came under budget or expenditure wise, and that uh, flushed through to our unassigned. So that's why at the bottom of the table you see back in June we thought, oh, we're going to have about 200K. Uh, now we're thinking around 1.4 million. And uh, another note is that reserves are at 11 million, which is fully funded. This goes into next year. While we have unassigned um, fund balances uh, estimated to be 1.4 million, going into 2024, 2025, we're, we are looking at an estimated deficit of around 3.9 million. As council uh, remembers, this is mostly due to rising costs of existing services and the loss of ARPA funds. As mentioned previously, if we end the year with some unassigned fund balances, this can, this can mitigate some of the, this deficit. So, for example, if we end the year at 1.4, um, that deficit of 4 
uh, comes down because we can use that to meet the deficit. But uh, for today, and, and as staff is working through this, we're working with four million being our marker. We have a task list. Currently, we're working on the cost allocation and fee study. This is to make sure that the fees that we are charging cover the cost of such services. Um, we're also meeting weekly to um, review all the expenditures line by line, asking ourselves if there's any flexibility or adjustments that can be made, anything that can optimize or limit the cost. And then also we're doing, uh, we're identifying any revenue enhancement options. I do want to stress that staff is working behind the scenes to curate the information, but this is, uh, this isn't a opaque process. Um, once we work through um, all, all the options and pathways and uh, we will bring those, we will present those updates to the finance committee for discussion and input. And from there, we have a mid-year and then another broad, uh, budget process to go through those options. And then finally, the last quick bit on the treasurer's report. This report just details what our cash balances are at. When, uh, at the end of the September, we had 47 million, about 15 million out of general fund. And then our average yield was 2.9%, uh, uh, which is up from last year. Last year at this time was 1.2. With that, I will take any questions. The recommendations is as follows. Accept the financial report and the treasurer's report for the quarter ended on September 30th, 2023. Thank you for a very good report. I appreciate it. It was very clear the trouble that we're in <laughs> and um, what we have to look forward to. Um, questions from council members? Or Madam comments? Mayor, if I might, there's a, if, if I could just take a moment to just share a little sure. bit more perspective before we go to questions. Thank you. Um, there's two things I want to point out and, 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 you know, they're not great, but I think it, it really spells out what we're facing in front of us. Um, so the first thing I want to just talk about is um, maybe, Ken, if you could go back to the reserves and fund balances slide, slide number five, I believe that's the one there. So, you know, the good news is uh, we finished last year. You know, th there's this kind of dual process that happens with our budget because we have to make guesses about upcoming budgets based on what we know while the fiscal year is still wrapping up. And then, as Ken indicated, we have to go through a closeout of the year, go through an audit before we know how we actually finish the year. So the good news is this past year, like many previous years, um, we finished in, in a better position than we estimated. We're very conservative. Um, we don't want to make assumptions about things that um, we can't substantiate. And, and so, as you see at the bottom on the right, our unassigned fund balance or savings at the end of this fiscal year is now estimated to be 1.5 million as opposed to the 185,000. But that can be a little bit deceiving because as we look up above in the uh, top section, we started this fiscal year with $6.3 million of unassigned fund balances, which means we've spent down about $5 million of unassigned fund balance. Or we've, we've kind of burned through, we have our, our reserves, which are like really dedicated savings and we burned through $5 million of other savings. And we know what caused that. It's a combination of uh, the major increases to law enforcement costs this fiscal year uh, that we didn't anticipate and, and kind of came up right before the budget process and really changed our financial outlook. But because we had a lot of unassigned fund balance and a lot of, um, in our, we're strong in our reserves, we felt comfortable moving forward with business as usual um, and, and giving ourselves this year to really dig in and find uh, improvements to our budget in future years. That being said, as Ken has showed, we're, we're really careful about how we spend and we've already realized a lot of savings this fiscal year and we'll continue to look for those things. So then if we go to slide number six, oh, just the next one. Oh, yes. Sure. 
Sure. So the, the sheriff's contract increased by about $1.5 million per year, and that will grow over time, not to the same degree that it did this year. And, and just if anybody's listening in, um, just a little bit of background. Um, the, the city contracts with the county for both sheriff and 911 dispatch services. Um, several cities within the county do this because the cost of providing these services on our own would be very prohibitive. We don't have the economies of scale to um, make, you know, make these more affordable. Um, every so often, I, I can't recall the exact timeline, but the county uh, legally has to go through a cost study to make sure that the fees they are charging for services are actually recovering the costs that they expend to provide those services. And uh, unfortunately, as they did that this past year, they discovered they were undercharging for a lot of services. Now, we benefit, benefited from that in the past, but of course, it is really hard to adjust on the fly to these significant changes that we're looking at going forward. And we're not alone in this. Many cities in the county are, are struggling with this. Um, so about a million and a half a year for um, police services, over $500,000 a year for 911 dispatch services. So that's a, a little over $2 million of that $4 million deficit was caused just on that action alone. It, it still leaves several million dollars that um, we are, and, and maybe I'll explain that as I go into this next slide. Um, I do want to explain some terminology. Um, you've heard several times tonight the term structural deficit come up. And I think it's an important term because there's a one-time deficit where, say, we, we've got a balanced budget, but there's a really, really important initiative that the city wants to take care of on a one-time basis. Maybe we want to you know, fix a, a major road or there's an emergency that we need to fix a road or there's a big park project. And we might decide, you know what, it's worth spending some of our reserves or some of this savings we have to make that project happen. And that's a deficit because we're spending money that isn't coming in, we're spending money we've saved. But that's a one-time deficit. You spend the money and then the next year you're right back to, to, to a balanced budget. Unfortunately, that's not the situation we're in right now. We have what's called a structural deficit that if, if we don't change anything, we are not bringing in as much money as we are obligated to spend based on the current services we provide and the current contracts that we have to be entered into to provide those services, which means we have to make changes to balance that budget over the long term because the only way to make up that deficit is to spend our savings and as we've seen, we're spending a lot of it this year. And then we start tearing into reserves and pretty soon that money runs out and now you don't have any way to balance that budget. So we really have an opportunity to look at our spending and our revenues and make changes, structural changes that are ongoing to balance our budget and make sure we're fiscally solvent going forward so that we don't have to use those reserves to balance our budget um, in the short term and certainly not in the long term. So to Ken's point, $4 million is our target to adjust because that is the deficit ongoing. Um, I, I, I will be honest, I don't think we fix it in one year. I think that's a lot of adjustment that we would have to make. Um, and, and of course, as he's mentioned, we're looking at making sure we're charging the right amount for our services. We're looking at our expenditures to see where we can make cuts and streamline our expenses. And we're looking at revenue enhancement, enhancement options. To do all of that and account for $4 million in one year is, is pretty challenging, but it is something we're gonna have to accomplish over the next couple of years before we start spending down our reserves. So it's a big task. As Ken mentioned, we are meeting uh, on a weekly basis to really dig in on all these issues. And uh, starting in the next few weeks, we will, we will begin meeting with the finance subcommittee to share what we're finding, share our recommendations, to collaborate and think through opportunities to deal with the three different areas that are opportunities and start finding solutions uh, that we can start implementing this fiscal year, next fiscal year, and going forward um, with, with the goal of balancing this budget um, and maintaining the reserves that we have. So that was a mouthful, but uh, I think it's important for folks to understand 
we're we're in a situation that's not sustainable right now, and so we've got to make some major changes to to get ourselves in a sustainable situation. And that is, didn't we recently do a fee study? And when you say, go back to that last slide. Sorry. No, the summit, the, the next slide, I guess, after this. Cost allocation and fee study. Is, is that one study? Okay. It's and one did, study, and, and we initiated it at the beginning of this fiscal year. So it was budgeted okay. to be done in this fiscal of. year. It started, um, it, it's, it's a long process. There's a lot of, uh, we have a consultant that is helping to do that because it's beyond you know, our capacity to sit down and dig in on. Um, Ken, do we have any estimates of when that study will actually be complete? Uh, the goal is mid, uh, mid year. Okay, so we, we hope to have that wrapped up by the end of this year so that when we hit mid, end of this calendar year, so that when we hit the mid-year budget revisions, we have a sense of where we might be able to make changes. Probably those changes would be implemented in the next fiscal year because it would require changes to our fee schedule and, mm -hmm. and uh, some notice to the people that we charge those fees to. All right, thank you. Questions from council members, comments? The, the only comment is I urge the city to identify the revenue enhancement options, but that's preaching to the choir. Thank you, Ken. Great report. Do we need to just check to see if there's any public comment? We should check for public comment. <laughs> Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this? Do we have anyone on Zoom? We have no online speakers, Mayor. Thank you, and I'm really glad one of you is always watching me on that, because I will always screw it up, I, I figured out. Um, okay, with that, we go to, trying to find the agenda here. We have a motion, right? Um, Mayor, could, we, could someone make a motion, please? Yes, could we have a motion? Yeah. I move that we accept the financial report and the treasurer's report for the quarter ended on September 30th, 2023. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions? Any no's? Thank you. Motion passed. We now can move to commission committee updates. I don't believe we have any updates tonight. Okay. For future discussion, possible agenda items. Nothing being... Madam, Madam Mayor, I'm sorry, could I jump in on this one? Sure. Even though I'm not a council member? Sure. <laughs> I, I just want to make notice, um, we're, we're looking at spe scheduling a special meeting at the end of this month to discuss um, a, a, a minimum wage item. Um, we would do it as a special study session, and uh, as soon as we have that finalized and scheduled, we'll notify the community, and that may come with the cancellation of the November 21st meeting, which is during the week of Thanksgiving and probably not something anybody wants to do, you know, the day, two days before Thanksgiving. So, okay, great. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll obviously provide a lot of notice to the community and all of that. Thank you. City Council reports. Seeing none, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you all.